A gray-haired old man lies on the ground. Blood flows from his mouth and nose. Life fades from his eyes. A young blue-haired guy with hair-colored eyes, dressed in a kimono and carrying a wicker basket on his back. The guy stands frozen in place with a blank look. A sickle lies on the floor next to him. The guy looks at the body of his grandfather, who was cut in half with this same sickle. The guy thought that his grandfather died such a cruel death, but there was not a tear in his eyes. Looking at the burning house, the guy thought that he did not feel any sadness, although his grandfather was his entire family. The guy remembered how he joyfully returned home, bringing with him the herbs that his grandfather sent him to look for. The grandfather, holding a tray with leaves in his hands, was delighted at the guy's return, but the guy said that the herbs were to the east of the valley, as the old man said. Seeing how many herbs the guy brought in the bag was surprised, saying that it would definitely be enough for a couple of ounces. The guy said that he came across a foxhole where there were only her cubs, to which the old man asked if the guy killed them. The guy incomprehensibly asked why he had to kill them, because the mother would be upset to see the dead children. The old man answered the guy that this was good, after which he said to sit down at the table when he finished with his business. The old man addresses the guy, calling him Chian Ma, and asks him to promise him something. Chian Ma asks Grandpa what exactly he wants the guy to promise. The old man tells Cheon to never show anyone the essence that lives inside him. Cheon asks for forgiveness from his grandfather, his eyes bloody and blazing with fire, and a devilish smile covers his face. Taking off from his seat, Cheon bent down as he ran, picking up the abandoned sickle that killed his grandfather. Growling furiously in a frenzy, Cheon thinks that he is unlikely to be able to keep his promise to his grandfather. View of Chongyang County Many buildings in the city covered with black tiles reflect the light of the setting sun. A carriage slowly rides along a busy city street, surrounded by guards. This cart carries all sorts of criminals, apostates, and robbers. Looking at the passing cart, the townspeople are talking, saying that the bandits and jackals from the pass have finally been caught. Other residents of the city simply curse the captured robbers, showering them with reproaches. Following the large cage, a little behind, was a cart with one single prisoner. From the window of the cafe, a mysterious man in a hat is watching what is happening talking with his interlocutor about who is being transported in the cart. In a single cart sits a blue-haired guy, shackled up to his arms and bandaged around the shoulder and chest. After drinking from the cup, the man said that the young man in the cage would be the same age as his young master. His interlocutor told him that you shouldn't judge people only by age because according to rumors, this guy is the most terrible prisoner in the world, to which the man replied that he was not surprised by such security. Calling the waitress, the man in the yellow robe told the stranger in the hat, turning to him as a master, saying that he was unlikely to be surprised by such a story. But then he continued by asking if the master was interested in how many people this guy had killed with his sickle, saying that he was nicknamed the ghost with the sickle. The man asked the master what the master instructed him to do this time, to which he replied that he had to save the man. Looking out the window, the master continued by saying that he must save the young man, who doesn't care when he dies. Suddenly a stone flew into the head of the ghost sitting in the cage, breaking his head and staining his blood. The surprised guard looks at the stone thrower who shouted that the maniac and heavenly punishment would not be enough. Hearing exclamations from the street, both men in the cafe turned their attention back to the streets. Seeing the indifferent and emotionless face of the ghost, the master opened his eyes in surprise. The ghost straightened his hair, blood flowed down his face and hair, while he himself only meekly glanced towards the master. The man grinned, saying that it would be better if the ghost were a girl, because he couldn't believe that he had such a face, to which the master, standing up sharply, replied that he hoped that his wish would never come true. The master leaves while the man calls out to him, shouting that he is leaving immediately after calling him, calling the stranger Master Cam. Master Cam goes out into the street, passing the cart on which the ghost is being transported, and goes in the opposite direction. Moving further and further away from the cart with the prisoners, Master Cam kept only the word found in his mind. Taking another look at the ghost sitting in the cage, the master thought that this guy was an ideal candidate. Night has fallen. The light illuminates the closed windows of the prison of the fortress of Chongyang County, into which Qian ended up. The time has come for the changing of the guard, and some guards came to replace others at the post. The two guards who had just arrived stood next to the door to Qian's cell. Sitting in the cell with stocks on his hands, Qian thought about the fact that he should have waited. Qian remembers the scarred face of a bearded man with a hat on his head. Then the man told him that although he knew that he was being followed, he did not think that he would be a new guy who did not know how to fight. Looking at his shining eyes, 
Somewhat reminiscent of Cheon's own eyes, he decided that this man was a real monster. Cheon thought that although he had found his grandfather's killer, he was not at all like an ordinary freak, because Cheon had never been able to get out of his grip. Hanging in the grip of his opponent, Cheon thought that it was impossible to kill him, remembering the brutality of ridicule. Cheon wondered if he would be able to defeat his grandfather's killer if he mastered martial arts. Looking up at the ceiling, Cheon wondered if he would have a chance for revenge. A stream of smoke suddenly rushed past Cheon's feet, quickly filling the room. Seeing the smoke, Cheon first decided that it was a fire, but then he noticed that the smoke was intoxicating. Remembering that while living with his grandfather, he had acquired a wealth of knowledge about herbs. By smelling the odors, Kion was able to pinpoint the presence of herbs such as Saurus and Angelica. Kion manages to distinguish Valerian with Trillium, while the guards, under the influence of smoke, begin to fall off their feet. Cheon remembered that by mixing all these herbs together, you can create dope, after which he sees that everyone else in the prison is lying unconscious. Inhaling the smoke of the dope once again, Cheon closes his eyes as the smoke rushes past him. Suddenly, the door to Cheon's cell opens, and Master Kam enters, standing opposite Cheon, who has lowered his head. Master Kam removes the chains that chained the stocks on Cheon's hands to the walls. However, Master Kam notices how the Phantom, who should already be passed out, is looking at him. Without having time to ask why the Phantom did not lose consciousness from the dope, the Master receives a blow to the stomach. Groaning in pain, the Master sees the ghost instantly run out of the cell, trying to escape. Running Chion thought that he did not understand what was happening but saw a chance to escape, confident that the dope would not finish him off. However, Chion's escape is interrupted by a sharp push from behind, which confuses the young man. Chion received four quick blows to the back on the pressure points, causing him to immediately slow down. Master Kam replied that he had paralyzed him and that now he would not be able to escape. But Chion was shocked by how quickly the warrior managed to get close to him. Grabbing Chion, the master forcefully threw him into the wall, deciding that paralysis was not enough. Clearing his throat, Chion glances at the warrior, at first deciding that this is his master. But after looking closely, Chion realizes that it's still not him, noticing the similarity, but thinking that the warrior in front of him does not have a scar on his left eye. Someone wearing a hat and looking like a nobleman asks Cam if this is the young man he was talking about. Cam answered the gentleman that he had better wait outside, but the man interrupted him saying that he had always wanted to see what prisons looked like, noting that there was nothing here but a stench. The man continues saying that he wants to see Cheon's face, ordering Cam to bring a chair for him while Cheon just silently watched. Cam, taking Cheon by the hair, lifts him from the floor and sits him down leaning on the wall. The man grins, saying that Cheon really does look like him, intending to take off his hat. Opening his eyes in surprise, Cheon looks at the man sitting in front of him. The man, who turned out to be his exact copy, replies that they found the double at the right time and in the right place, calling it a wonderful coincidence. Looking at Chion's surprised face, the man grins again, saying that he understands his surprise. Sitting on a bench with a hat in his hand, the guy says that he heard that Kion will be executed in two days and quartered. Kion answers his interlocutor in the affirmative, saying that everything is correct. The guy answers Chion that this is an unenviable fate, saying that they were born with the same faces, but one became a nobleman and the second was sentenced to death. The young man continues, saying that Cheon has the right to a second chance, from which the latter immediately perks up. He invites Cheon to become a double of Mokyong-gun, a master from the Brotherhood of Swords, introducing himself at the same time. Annoyed by this proposal, Cheon began to think about what kind of chance he was being offered. Mok tells Cheon they are not afraid, telling him to imagine a mansion, delicious food, maids, and a soft bed. In addition, to add that with a salary like theirs, Cheon will be able to go wherever he wants. Kam holds out his hand with the red pill, telling Cheon that if he makes up his mind, he should eat it. Kaon asks if it is poison, to which Kam replies that they did not come to the suicide bomber for the sake of killing. Kam says that Cheon will receive the antidote after he completes their task, asking if Cheon is ready. Looking at the pill, Cheon mentally remembers his grandfather, thinking that he got a second chance. Having swallowed the pill, Cheon continued the thought that now he had a chance to get even with his grandfather's killer. Cheon asked the two if they would now allow him to have a second chance. Mok says it was a wise decision, telling Kam to remove Cheon's shackles. By delivering repeated blows to Cheon's pressure points, Kam restored his ability to move, after which he removed the shackles. Standing up to his full height, Kaon sighed, stretching his arms, which were swollen from the shackles and stretching his legs. Kam tells Mok that he will go ahead, telling the master to follow him, to which Mok agrees. Mok turns to Cheon, 
telling him that it is time for them to move forward. Cam opened the door of the dungeon, looking around, and then said that the outside was clear and that they could go. But turning around, Cam saw that Mach was facing Cheon, frozen in place. Cheon looked at Cam with a sadistic smile, twisting his neck to Meister Mach. Discouraged, Cam cannot comprehend what is happening, shouting out the question, What the hell is this? Mach's body with his neck twisted falls at Cheon's feet, an emotion of horror frozen on Mach's face. Cheon asks Cam, frozen in emotion of surprise, what they should do, feigning surprise. Smiling madly, Cheon tells Cam that it seems to him that his double is already dead. It's night outside, screams are heard throughout the city while one of the buildings is blazing with fire. Inside a burning building, someone is holding a severed human head by the hair. Thinking about how much fun he is having, the man with the sickle chops everyone he meets left and right. With a crazy smile, waving a sickle and cutting up everyone he meets, Cheon thinks about how much fun he is having. Standing surrounded by corpses, Cheon thinks about the fact that until this moment, he had killed everyone, in his opinion, responsible for the death of his grandfather. Cheon remembered his grandfather's words that he should not allow the essence inside him to escape. Throwing away the head he had cut off, Cheon thought about what he should do now that the people in front of him were dead. Smiling and laughing, Cheon touches his face with a bloody hand, realizing what kind of entity his grandfather was talking about. Suddenly, one of the survivors backs away, calling out Cheon as a ghost while the latter comes at him with a sickle. Cheon wondered if he was truly evil, and then decided to think about it after finishing off the survivor. But before he can swing his sickle, Cheon receives a powerful kick to the side. Cheon's outrages were interrupted by a man in a red cloak and a wicker hat, holding a sheathed sword with one hand. From the blow he received, Cheon went into a long flight to the other side of the room. While Cheon was lying on the floor clearing his throat, the man saved by the stranger ran screaming while the warrior looked thoughtfully at Cheon. The man grins, saying he's impressed that Cheon is still alive, unsheathing his sword. The shaking Cheon, holding his aching side, just silently looked at the unfamiliar warrior, looking at a stranger. Seeing his flaming eyes, Cheon immediately realized that this man was dangerous. Approaching Cheon, the man said that in his opinion, the fighter from Cheon is insignificant. Quickly approaching Cheon, surprised by the speed of the stranger, the warrior asked how he could withstand his blow. The warrior grabbed Cheon by the throat, but Cheon wondered how he got to him so quickly, asking if there was a person in front of him. The man replies that he knew that he was being watched, but did not believe that it would be a man who did not know how to fight. Before the man can ask a question, he pierces Cheon's stomach with his blade, still holding him by the throat. Taking the blade out of Cheon, who was coughing up blood, the man again says that it's still surprising that such a new guy could withstand his blow. Having pierced Cheon again, already in the shoulder area, the man added that it would still be better to get rid of him. The man told Cheon that he shouldn't have killed left and right like that, because he could still live in peace. Cheon realizes with bitterness that as soon as he found his grandfather's killer, he was immediately and easily defeated. Cheon's gaze faded, and before losing consciousness, the only thing he thought about was whether he would kill him like this. However, Cheon managed to survive, although he was sentenced to death for his crime. Cheon thinks that if he got just one more chance, he would definitely achieve his goal. Cheon breaks Mok's neck as Master Kam looks on in bewilderment. Kam grabs Cheon by the throat and screams bastard and slams Cheon against the wall while his hat flies off his head. Shocked, Cam asked Cheon how he dared to kill the young master, wondering if he had gone crazy. To which Cheon, smiling, asked, What if it's the other way around? Because a double always takes risks when it replaces the original. Still in Kam's grip, Cheon replies that he is clear-headed enough not to die for Mach. To which Kam asks if Cheon is afraid of dying by his hand. To which Cheon retorts that if Cam wanted, he would have been dead a long time ago. Cheon told Kam that he and his master were probably not that close to which Cam reacts by throwing Cheon over his shoulder. Slamming Cheon's face into the ground, Cam twisted his right arm, immobilizing him. Having immobilized Cheon, Cam reached for the dagger behind his back, jerking to reveal the sparkling blade. Drawing his blade, Cam tells Cheon that he will now die, frozen over his immobilized opponent. Smiling, Cheon answers whether he really thinks so, after which Cam asked why he should think differently. Cheon replies that he took poison and that he cannot survive without an antidote which means that he will only have to obey Kam. Kian continued by saying that this is much more convenient for the master, because now the master of the Brotherhood of Swords will be his faithful dog. Cam was taken aback, asking if he meant that Cam should betray the young master by becoming his puppeteer. Kian grins. He and Cam exchange meaningful glances, to which Cam only eloquently remains silent. Exhaling, 
Cam raised his blade over Cheon's head and then prepared to strike. Cam froze, holding the hilt of the blade, which was pointed straight at Cheon's head. But the blade did not reach its target, stopping right in front of Cheon's face, cutting off one of his locks. Rising, Cam said that from now on, Cheon is Makyongun, master of the Brotherhood of Swords. Kion, definitely satisfied with what he heard, broke into a smile, maintaining his empty gaze. Kion and Kam are in the Brotherhood of Swords, a large fenced area resembling a fortress. While changing his clothes, Kam tells Kion that he won't have to meet the fraternity members. Kion replies that there won't be much difference with his double, to which Kam told him not to doubt himself, since he took the role of a puppet, because if he is discovered, it will not be possible to neutralize the poison. Coming closer, Cam said that if Kaon disobeys or becomes cunning, he will die immediately. To which Kion, grinning, only answered in the affirmative, saying that he understood everything. Cam throws a pill to Chion to neutralize the poison, telling him that he needs to take one every 12 hours if he doesn't want to die from the poison, and tells him to keep that in mind. Dawn lit up the cloud-covered sky, marking the end of the most unusual night of Cheon's life. Taking a bite of a poison neutralization pill, Cheon thinks that he is extremely lucky. Holding the wounds, Cheon thinks that surviving despite such wounds is a miracle, but he got another chance. Sitting on the window of the estate, Cheon remembers that his grandfather told him not to rush to the next world, to which Cheon asked his grandfather not to worry, because he will not leave until he takes revenge. Cheon remembers the face of his grandfather's killer, thinking that he is sure that Cheon is dead and Mokyongun's body has already been found. Then, thinking that the Brotherhood of the Sword is a fighting clan, Kaon decided to impersonate their master in order to train hard and find his grandfather's killer. He thought back to the day he saw his grandfather's body cut in half. After which, smiling, he decided that his grandfather's killer would die the same death. A clear sky with clouds wandering across it. A tall pagoda rises inside the Brotherhood's fortress. Kaon sits at the table in his estate, thinking about the fact that he miraculously survived. Several dishes are laid out on the table in front of Kion, picking up the noodles with chopsticks. Chion reasons that now he has a chance to learn martial arts. However, Kion sees the silhouette of a man behind the door, realizing that this is a guard assigned by Master Kam, who must look after him, which annoys him. Standing in front of the door is a bearded man, Kokan, Master Kam's junior guard, wearing a green robe armed with a sword, tapping his foot and clasping his hands behind his back. Kokan's face is distorted into an emotion of irritation, but Kokan only remains silent with displeasure. Continuing to tap his foot on the ground, Kokan wonders why they weakened the punishment for a guy who is not even trained in martial arts. A shocked Gochang shouts at Master Kam, asking if he really killed Mok Yungun. Kam immediately shuts him up, telling him to stop yelling and adding that his job won't change because of it. Kam tells Gochan to watch and keep an eye on Chion so that he doesn't run away, saying that he will prepare for the next meeting for now. After this meeting, Kam plans to get rid of Chion, which surprises Gocheng. Kam continued, saying that as soon as he was done with him, he would immediately start a new life. Gochan asks Kam if he didn't tell you that Chion took poison. Gochan continued by asking if he had the opportunity to disobey, given that they had chosen the third young master, after which Kam interrupted him, saying that Chion was not like that. Gokan asked Kam again, to which Kam replied that Chion would not tolerate violence, because being a suicide bomber, he thought of killing Mok Yong-gun and taking his place. When leaving, Cam says that although he is obliged to protect him, he is still a psycho, and therefore Cam hopes that everything will end soon. Looking after the departing Cam, Gochan only silently looked after him. Hitting the door behind him with his head, Gochan does not understand what is special about Kion, because he's not a fighter, and besides, he is poisoned, after which he thinks that he is unlikely to disobey under the threat of execution. Hearing the guard knocking his head on the door, Cheon just silently looks in his direction. Continuing to eat noodles, Cheon thought that Cam didn't say why he needed a double. He only left a guard so that Cheon wouldn't run away. Cheon thought that even though he had not been in the Brotherhood for long, he already understood the original, thinking that nothing was in danger for him yet, considering that it was not so dangerous here, but too safe. Tapping his finger on the table, Cheon thought that it was impossible to do without a substitution. Smirking, Cheon wondered whether it was worth remaining silent if he so needed a double. Breaking the chopsticks in his hand, Cheon decided that now it was his time to become the boss. Gohan, who was guarding the door to Cheon's room, tired of banging his head against the door, decided to take a nap while standing. Gohan, scared, woke up when Cheon opened the door and left the room. Gochan asked Cheon what he was doing, believing that he was going to the restroom, which Cheon confirmed. 
saying that he would not be long and asking if Gochen would go with him. Gochen pointed an irritated finger at the room, telling Qian to shut up and go back. Qian asked if his name was Go Chung, saying that it would be better for both of them to close their eyes. Go Chung grabs Qian by the clothes and then slams him hard against the door, which Qian is clearly not very happy about. Holding Qian, Go Chung tells Qian that he forgot his place and that he should not hope to deceive him and return to the room. Qian just silently looks at Go Chung with the empty look that Qian is already accustomed to. Taking Go Chung by the shoulder, Qian said that Go Chung was much weaker than calm, which confused Go Chung. With a sharp movement, Qian grabbed Go Chung by the wrist, after which he immediately threw him over his shoulder. Having knocked Go Chung to the ground, Qian used the same grip on him that he experienced on himself from calm. Frightened Kokan caught himself thinking he couldn't move, which made him wonder if he was paralyzed. Gokna, thinking that Qian was hiding his martial art, suddenly begins to move, which makes Qian annoyed. Continuing to hit Gokan's painful points with his finger, Qian said that Master Kam did it much better, while Gochang screamed heartrendingly. Looking at Qian with tears in his eyes, Kokan thought about what Qian was carrying. He couldn't just spy Master Kam's skill. Looking straight into Qian's face, distorted by a smile, Kokan realized that Master Kam was right that Qian was a real psycho. Suddenly, Gokan stood up and asked Qian if he had forgotten that he had been poisoned. Gokan, breaking into a scream, reminds Qian that without an antidote, he will die bleeding to death in hellish torment. Before Gochang can continue his incredibly persuasive speech, Qian grabs him by the jaw. Under Gochang's distorted words, Cheon answered him that he really took poison, asking how he could forget, biting a hangnail on his finger. Opening Gochang's mouth, Qian poured his blood into his mouth, flowing down his bitten finger. Grabbing his throat and clenching his legs as if from suffocation, all of Kokan's thoughts were filled only with the word poison. Trying to cough up blood, Kokan thought that he had to cleanse the blood. While Cheon said that since childhood, he had tried different poisons while collecting herbs with his grandfather. After which he kicked Kokna and added that at some point Cheon's blood itself turned into poison. Licking his finger, Cheon said that he recognizes any ingredient by taste and smell, and besides, no poison affects him. Smiling at Gocheng, Cheon says that he won't need an antidote to their poison. Suddenly, Cheon's face changes to a friendly smile, after which he says that he wanted to ask how things were going with the Brotherhood. After which, Kion adds that he is the only one who has the antidote, adding that he is sure that they will get along. In the middle of the Brotherhood's fortress stands a massive building, which is the headquarters of the Brotherhood of Swords. In the chambers of the head of the clan, a bearded, long-haired man lies on the bed, and another person stands next to him. On the bed lies the head of the Mokindan clan, whose beard and hair are streaked with gray, as if suffering from a fever. The old man in the hat being a doctor said that nothing was working, holding a towel in his hand. Wiping the sweat from the face of the clan head, the doctor thought that he had tried all possible herbs, but still did not understand either the cause of the disease or the cure for it. The disgruntled doctor reflects that it would have been great if the head of the clan decided on the issue of an heir. There were four candidates left in the Brotherhood, but none of them was appointed as a successor, which is why a storm will soon come, because with the death of the head, blood will be shed for his place. The doctor thought that the head's wife would not stand aside and would do everything to ensure that her son took his place, when suddenly a woman appeared behind him. A woman decorated with luxurious jewelry, who was the first wife of the head of the clan named Sok, asked how the head was feeling. The doctor responded by exclaiming to the lady that he was glad to see her, but Sok only replied that she asked him about her husband's well-being. The doctor apologized, saying that they had no idea how to treat the head saying that it was all very strange, to which the head's wife just sighed, saying that she thought so. Juice tells the doctor that if medicines don't help, then only a Taoist spell can help, which causes the doctor to become overwhelmed. The doctor replied to the first wife that Taoist spells were mere superstitions, wondering how they could rely on such things. The woman looking at the doctor asks if the doctor decided that she left her husband to his fate. Without allowing the doctor to answer, Sayok replied that she did not want to hear anything, and that the master was already on his way to the main house, and therefore asked Dr. Ha not to interfere. Smiling mysteriously, Juice tells the maids that now she will fight for her husband's life with the help of magic, and therefore they should not let anyone inside. Holding his fist to his chin, Go Chang told Cheon that this is how the Brotherhood works. Holding his chin, Cheon says that in general, he understands the situation in the Brotherhood. Rising from the floor, Qian invites Gochang to get on the road, since this is all. 
When Kokan asks where they will go, Qian replies that they will go to the head of the clan. Qian and Kochen left the estate, where Qian, according to Kam's plan, was supposed to wait for orders. Qian says that if Gocheng's words are to be believed, Mokyonggun and Master Kam wanted to use Qian to remove Mokyongho and finish off both candidates, which Gocheng confirms. Holding a paper in his hand with a picture of a certain man, Qian thinks that this is perhaps their best plan. The first of the candidates is Mokyongho, 20 years old, a special feature is a scar on his left cheek, loves women and carousing, does not want to train, and therefore is the least competent. Then 18-year-old Mokin Pyong, whose sharp eyes he inherited from his mother, has intelligence and cunning, so it is unknown what he will do for the post of head of the clan. According to Kam's plan, Qian was supposed to provoke Maki Pyong to kill Qian, after which the eldest son would allegedly accidentally hurt his brother, killing two birds with one stone. As a result of the brawl, only one would remain, which Cheon calls how to ride into heaven on someone else's hump. It doesn't matter which of the candidates will survive. The main thing is that two of them will die, and Mokyonggun would remain unharmed, and therefore would immediately win. Cheon thinks that his tactics were very well thought out, but with his death, a new player appeared. Gokhan asked Cheon why he, the young master, should visit the head, to which Cheon said that he had to come, because his life and death did not depend on him. While Qian was scattering torn pieces of dossiers on the candidates, Go Chang warned that Master Kam would be unhappy if he found out about this. Qian said that he was sure that Gokan would not tell Kam the secret, for which he thanked him in advance, which made Gochen noticeably tense. First wife Sok stands at the entrance to the clan head's estate, holding a fan in her hand, waiting. Someone with a staff in his hand slowly approaches the entrance to the head's estate, going to meet Mrs. Sok. The man who approached turned out to be a Taoist master named Myoshin, who immediately asked if he could see the master. Sok, keeping silent at first, replied that she had heard that he was the best master, and therefore she would completely trust him. The old man thanks the lady, after which he says that the longer this lasts, the worse it gets, so he asked to immediately take him to the head. The old man continued, saying that everyone should leave the palace, including the lady, to which Sok replied that only the guards remained in the palace. Sok clarified with Myosin, because he had not forgotten anything, to which the old man replied that of course not. Myosin asked Mrs. Sok, what about his payment and the master's seal promised to him? Sok replied that if Myosin succeeds, he will be given 300 gold pieces, for which the old man humbly thanks. Lady Sok ordered everyone to leave the palace and not enter it until Sok ordered it, and her order was immediately obeyed. Moving away from the palace, Sok thought that in fact she didn't really believe in all this Taoist magic, but circumstances forced her. Entering the training area, Siak notices a bare-chested man practicing a pose. Looking at the young man, she recognizes him as Mok Yuchin, the fourth son, adding a note about what a degenerate he is. Irritated, Sok thought that this idiot could be understood, but turning around, she continued to think that he should not even think about the place of the head, because she would not allow this. Mr. Siak headed in the other direction from the training ground, followed by her maids. Just as Siak is about to leave, Cheon and Gokhan approach the training ground. Cheon hums questioningly. Looking towards the site, Cheon asked Gochang who they were both seeing now. Gochang replied that this is the fourth son, adding that he trains hard, but Cheon remembers that the guy's name is Mokyuchon. Watching Mokyuchon, Cheon thinks that even though he said that he seems careless, in reality he is confident and decisive, which makes him look like the head of the clan and also looks like he values friendship highly. Qian asked Gochang if it was possible to learn martial arts like this, to which Gochang replied that the stance of a horse in which a guy stands develops the strength of the lower body. Gochang also added that this is where all martial arts come from, which is why Qian mockingly calls him Master Gochang. Then, with a completely indifferent face, Qian asked if he could kill Cam by becoming a master, causing Gochang to fall into a stupor. Qian turned around without hearing the answer and asked if he could kill Cam if he became a master. Gokhan, with visible panic on his face, wonders why Cheon came up with such a question, believing that he already understood that they were going to abandon him, surprised by Cheon's intelligence. Gocheng answered Cheon that the basis of martial arts is internal training, and Cheon asked what it was. Kokan replied that this is what they call breathing, saying that through breathing, the energy of nature circulates in the body, accumulating chi energy and the more of it, the stronger you are. Then he continues, saying that it is impossible to master chi energy in a day, because even if everything works out, such a first-class warrior cannot be defeated, 
because it took Kam more than 30 years. Cheon replied that Kam had clearly succeeded in this, adding that this was unlikely to happen in a short time, which Gochong confirmed. However, behind Cheon's back, Gochong mockingly thinks that Cheon will never succeed. Gochon did not say that time is also important for internal training. So if you do not sharpen Qi Yi, at least from five to nine, then energy will accumulate, but will never be properly collected. Looking at Qian, Go Chang continued to mentally mock, saying that even his life would not be enough to collect all the energy. Smirking and looking away, Go Chang compared Qian to a frog in a well, believing that Qian would never succeed. Suddenly, Qian turns around and with a blank look reaches his hands towards Go Chen's face. Pushing back Go Chang's eyelid with his finger, Qian replied that his eyes were so attractive that Qian wanted to tear them out. Then letting go of his face, Qian with a friendly smile invited Go Chang, calling him a master, to become his man. After which Qian quickly turned around, hearing an uncertain agreement from Go Chang. While Go Chang covers his eyes with his hands, Qian wonders if he couldn't just kill Kam, because he doesn't trust Qian and therefore it will be difficult to win him over to his side. Go Chang tells Qian that they better get out of here quickly. Qian wonders why. Go Chang replies that the third son did not get along with his younger brother, and Cheon asks why. Go Chung says that two years ago, the younger brother insulted his own mother, after which the third beat him half to death, which made Cheon laugh. Cheon laughs, saying that the third brother is quite cute. To Go Chung's misunderstanding, Cheon replies that at least they are still alive. Coach Khan says that it's time for them to go, otherwise there will be big troubles. The sunset descended on the palace, causing the sky to turn purple like lilac flowers. There was still not a soul in the palace following the order given by Lady Sayok. There are many red threads stretched along the room. Some of them have coins twitching on them. The hands and feet of the head of the clan are tied to threads that entangle most of the space of the bed. Myoshin stands nearby, holding the threads in his hands. Corruption spreads throughout the body of the clan head, flowing through the veins and approaching the heart. The old man thought about it. At first glance, it looks like poisoning, but there is definitely something deadly here and the monk is surprised that the head could withstand so much, wondering what kind of mighty warrior he is. Having opened his suitcase, the old man understood that with every passing moment, the chances that the warrior would survive were getting less and less. Having taken out paper and ink, Myosin intended to do what was asked of him, regardless of whether the warrior died or not. Sitting down on his knees in front of the paper, the old man raised the brush soaked in ink over the paper. Drawing secret signs on paper with ink, the old man created a talisman saying a prayer. Having finished reading the prayer and finishing the talisman, the old man immediately threw it towards the head of the clan. Having stuck to the body of the head of the clan, the talisman began to shine with light, illuminating the room with rays. The old man began to make seals with his fingers, shouting spells, ordering him to appear and fight. The head of the clan groaned painfully as Miocian continued to make seals, talking about the general who protects the Dharma and instills the trap before the manifestation of the form of the golden body. Changing the seal again, the old man continued, speaking about the golden and unsullied body of the Buddha, the protector of the water crystals, the Dharma, which made the warrior cry out in pain. Shocked that the flesh was too strong, the old man rushed to finish the ritual. Under the pressure of the old man, the eyes of the clan had turned red, and the cries of pain become louder. Suddenly, Myosin hears a noise behind him, causing him to be distracted from the ritual. Turning around in horror, the old man decided that it was Mrs. Sock, thinking that if she disturbed him, something terrible would happen. Suddenly, dark energy erupts from the clan leader, throwing the old monk back and knocking over his tools. The throne priest was surprised that he did not hit the wall, but someone's legs. Turning around, he saw Chion and Koken, who asked the old man in horror what was happening here. The confused old man does not have time to ask who is in front of him, as Kion, under the questioning cries of Kochan, moved forward. Smiling, Chion folds his hands forcefully, greeting the head of the clan. Under the surprised glances of Myosin and Go Chang, Qian greeted his father, who was groaning and passed out. Continuing to look with a smile at the lying head, Qian says that he is glad to see him. A loud cry was heard from the palace of the head of the clan, demanding to leave immediately. Qian stood over the clan leader's body, wheezing in agony, as the monk urged Qian and Go Chang to leave immediately. Myosin says that he almost managed to control the demon inside the head of the clan, but now he will become much stronger again telling those present to get out. The old man, hysterical, tries to convince Qian and Gochang to leave because otherwise he will not be able to finish what he started. Suddenly, to the surprise of everyone present, the head of the clan groaned loudly, stunning everyone around him. 
Kion and Kokon looked in surprise at the head who suddenly screamed, to which Myosin only sighed in annoyance. Kion watched as the eyes of the screaming clan head suddenly began to transform, barely resembling human ones. The talisman on the head's body burned down, and the filth began to be released from his body again. When Myosin saw this, he realized that a demon had taken possession of his soul. Myosin rushed to Gochang and Cheon, telling them to help him restrain the possessed leader and prevent him from breaking the threads. The possessed clan leader soared above the bed, and the threads began to fall off his arms and legs, leaving the heroes little time to act. Gochang and Cheon clung to the head of the clan, while Myosin pasted a talisman on his forehead and began to read a prayer. From the words spoken by Myosin and the influence of the talisman, the demon lost his temper and screamed. Having grabbed Kochan's hand, the demon immediately twisted it, leaving Kochan no chance. Kochan screamed pitifully, his eyes watering and sweat rolling down his forehead. Kion and Kochan were surprised that the possessed man managed to tear off a piece of the bed. Myosin replied that the demon had become stronger. Myosin told the guys to hold the head tightly, because they will all be finished if the monster manages to get out. Kokon notices how the demon is crawling towards him along the head's hand, which is why he screams. Seeing that the demon had almost overtaken his hand, Kokon shouted, saying that the monster was already here. Immediately reacting to Gochang's cry, Cheon cuts off the head's hand with a swing of his blade, preventing the monster from reaching Gochang. Kaon saw that the demon had avoided the blow and went up the arm and back to the body. Seeing Kaon's crazy face, Gochana asks what Cheon is up to and tells him to stop. Kion, without listening to Gochkan's advice, cuts off the head's forearm with a blade, separating the demon from the body. Kokhan, splashed with blood, thought with horror that Chion was crazy because he just went and cut off the master's hand. As soon as the severed hand with the demon in it fell to the floor, Myosin immediately stuck a talisman on it. While Kokhan was wrapping the head's shoulder with one hand, Myosin silently bent over the severed hand. Looking at Kochkan, Myosin realizes that not only did he not fulfill the request, but the head's hand was also cut off, which is why he decides to run away before everyone gets alarmed. Myosin's thoughts were interrupted by Kion's blade aimed at his neck, preventing the old man from escaping. Looking at Chion pointing his blade at him, Myosin became indignant, asking what the hell this was. Gochang was about to ask Chion what he was doing, but Chion pointed at him with his finger to keep his mouth shut. Kion asked Myosin what happened to the head, to which the monk replied that a demon had possessed him and that he could still die. Myosin continued, saying that there was almost no time left and asking if Kion also wanted the death of the head. Hearing the word too, Kion asks Myosin who wanted the death of the head of their clan. Gocheng is shocked, Chion asks the monk who hired him, to which Myosin replies that it was all a misunderstanding. Kion tells Myosin that his hands are stronger than the old man's and therefore with honesty, he will make his life easier. The old man, without thinking twice, answered Cheon that his mother hired him because she didn't really want to save her husband. Myosin continued by saying that, with the help of the demon, he was supposed to find out about the holy book and the master's seal, which shocks Gochian and causes confusion in Kion. Gochang is amazed that the master's wife is capable of such a thing, thinking that the eldest son has practically taken Cheon's place. Gochang immediately shouts that Cheon must save the head of the clan, surprising Cheon. Thinking that they cannot allow Mokyungo to become the lord, he says that otherwise Seok will not leave him behind. Agreeing with Gochang's opinion, Cheon understands that Sok interfered, but Myosin says that he can save the head of the clan. However, Cheon stops the old man's speech about salvation at any cost, which causes misunderstanding in Myosin. Cheon replies that they still need to find the holy book and seal, so he tells Myosin to continue searching. Gohan, just like the old man, are shocked by such a statement. Not believing that in such a situation, Cheon will think about the book and the press more than about the life of the head. Miosin says that if the monster inhabits the head's body again, it will only get worse, to which Kion just says to hurry up, while Kokon wonders what Kion is thinking about calling him a psycho. Agreeing to Cheon's request, Miosin entwines red threads around the head's hand, along with the severed hand and the wooden doll. Looking at the wooden humanoid figurine in the hands of the old man, Chion asks what it is. Myosin replied that this was a voodoo doll that would help deceive the demon, because if the head came into contact with the demon again, he would die. Placing the voodoo doll on the head's severed hand, Myosin wound one of the red threads around his finger, casting a spell. The demon immediately broke free from the severed hand, grabbing the doll with a hand formed from flesh. The head's eyes immediately began to shine, 
and the room was filled with his furious scream. While the old man continued to read the spell, his hand squeezed the doll more and more tightly, gradually breaking it. Myosin, having covered himself with sweat, realizes that the flesh has become stronger, and if he presses a little harder, the ghost will be freed. The old man wonders what he should do since the young man is unlikely to listen to him. However, with a sly smile, the old man suddenly comes up with a plan for further action. Myosin tells Chion that he will control the demon, but asks him to stay with him. Chion decides that this is a funny idea and stays while Gochin leaves the room, saying that he won't be long. As soon as the door slammed behind Kokon, the old man continued the ritual, casting a spell that made the demon inside the head's body groan. Suddenly the demon asked through the head's body who called him, throwing the old man and Chion into shock. Myosin, delighted with his success, immediately asked the ghost, asking him to tell him something. Myosin asked the ghost where the holy book and the master's seal are. Wheezing, the ghost replies that the book and seal are in the basement of the medical ward, in the stone gates. Hearing that the book and seal were in the medical room in the stone gate, Chion and Myosin tensed, when suddenly the voodoo doll that the ghost's hand was holding breaks into splinters. The old man immediately shouts to Chion that he must cut the thread, which Chion does not understand. Myosin replies that the demon wants to destroy the body of the clan head, and therefore asks Chion to hurry up. Chion, with a swing of his sword, cuts the thread in the place where the distorted flesh has almost reached, when suddenly the flesh attacked Chion himself, entangling his leg with many arms. As the arms continued to entangle him, Chion glanced at Myosin, whose face was distorted into a smile. There were more and more hands enveloping Chion, and they practically covered his face. Myosin sticks a talisman on Kaon's face, thinking that the ghost and a strong monster have possessed him. Looking at the destroyed voodoo doll, the old man thinks that the release of the ghost was only a matter of time, and therefore he very successfully made Chion his vessel. Myosin decides that it would be best to blame everything on Kion, thereby killing two birds with one stone. The demon that possessed Kion asks him how he dared to deceive him with a puppet. Looking at Cheon, the demon is surprised that he was deceived by him, noticing Cheon's sweet face. The demon replies that he will take Cheon's body instead of the old man, and then tells Cheon to be stuck in his own mind forever. The bright sun is shining from behind the treetops. Cheon is standing, carrying a wicker basket on his back. Cheon stands by the stream, holding a bucket in his hand and admiring the surrounding nature. Looking around, he finds the landscape extremely familiar, realizing that this is his mineral spring. Listening to the bird chirping, Chion thinks about how quiet and beautiful it is in the mountains. While collecting water from the spring, Cheon says that he cannot forget this spring, because he came to it every day. Walking back along the path with water, Cheon catches himself thinking that he is now feeling a strange sensation. Hearing an unclear noise in the distance, Cheon thinks that it's as if someone is leading him, after which he silently thinks. Suddenly, looking at the trees, he notices a pillar of smoke and fire behind the trees, instantly alarmed. The shocked Cheon suddenly realizes that all this time he was walking towards his house, which makes him even more horrified. Having thrown the bucket of water, Cheon immediately begins to run towards the house, shouting to his grandfather. Running towards the house, Cheon mentally prays that this is not what he thinks about. Running out to the burning house, Cheon notices his grandfather's body lying on the ground, cut in half. Grabbing his grandfather's body, Cheon screams in panic, begging his grandfather to hold on and not die. Holding the body in his arms, Cheon thought that he finally understood what kind of person his grandfather was. Pressed against the crippled body of his grandfather, Cheon realizes that his grandfather was very dear to him. Watching from behind and hearing Cheon's thoughts, the demon raised his hand, realizing what exactly Cheon wanted. Pointing his hand towards Cheon, the demon concentrated the filth and then directed it towards Cheon. As soon as the filth overtook Cheon, his eyes and ears became covered with dark lines, and behind Cheon, he heard the voice of his grandfather calling him. Grandfather asked Cheon if he wanted to help him, saying that Cheon was kind of absent-minded. Shocked by the fact that a living grandfather suddenly appeared in front of him, Cheon does not understand what the hell is happening. Intoxicated by the demon's spell, Cheon stops hugging his grandfather, causing the grandfather to drop the wicker basket. Grandfather asks Cheon what's wrong, saying that he almost knocked him down, to which Cheon only apologizes to his grandfather. Hugging his grandfather, Chion thinks that he will not lose him again, because his grandfather is the only thing worth living for. Grandpa chuckles good-naturedly as he hugs Chion, just as the demon behind Chion laughs. Watching the embrace of Chion and grandfather, the demon suddenly comes to a conclusion. The demon thinks that the annoying but precious past and memories with love are doomed to be lost. While Chion asks his grandfather why he was given such a name, 
the demon thinks that let Chion continue to stay with his grandfather. With his eyes sparkling, the demon thinks that now Kaon will never lose his grandfather again. When suddenly Chion turns around, piercing the demon behind with a blank stare, Chion immediately rushes at the demon who has not had time to understand anything, grabbing his mask-like face. While the grandfather froze with a sickle in his hands, Chion, who grabbed the demon, thanks him for the unpleasant memory. The demon asks Chion how he can see him, but Chion only replies that he is annoyed when they try to deceive him with the image of his grandfather. Smiling, Chion asks the demon if it seemed to him that the demon was mistaken. Chion continues by saying that the demon decided that what he wants most is happiness, but in reality, that's not what Chion wants. Chion says that the only thing he wants is for his grandfather's killer to die by his hand. Chion is still holding the demon's face, which is why he understands that Chion is pouring into him, saying that he has a rich imagination and a sincere desire to kill. Looking at Chion's face distorted by a crazy smile, the ghost thinks that even a vengeful spirit would not refuse such pure anger. The demon realizes that Kaon is hiding his identity, but that his intention is tied to something, when suddenly the grandfather decides to tell Kion the secret of his name. The grandfather, who began to evaporate behind him, says that Chion is a unique boy, but his grandfather wanted him to remain good and correct, and therefore his name means justice. Crumbling to a skeleton, grandfather tells Kion to remember his name and bear it with honor. The ghost cannot withstand Kion's pressure, causing his mask to begin to fall into pieces. Having escaped Cheon's grasp, the ghost realizes that he urgently needs to escape. Taking the sickle in his hands, Cheon immediately rushed after the ghost, who said that Cheon was a real psycho and that it was advisable for him to run away. The spirit managed to break away from Cheon, thanks to the fact that it penetrated his body and therefore decides to calm down because he can take control of his body. Suddenly, the ghost found himself in the middle of a blooming green field dotted with flowers. Not far away, the ghost saw massive sealed doors standing in the middle of the field. The ghost is surprised that he ended up on the field and that there is a meadow inside Chion's soul. Coming closer, the ghost examined the gate, noticing with surprise that it was there. The ghost sees that on the gate, which is the gate to the memory of Kion, there is a seal of Buddha, which is why he does not understand why his memory is locked. The ghost, who ignored the seal, stretched out his hand to see for himself what was behind the gate, when suddenly it began to dissipate. Darkness immediately enveloped the legs of the ghost, who, realizing that the decay was going in the opposite direction, immediately begged. Shrouded in darkness, the ghost began to fall through and dissipate, being absorbed by Kion. Although the ghost tried to resist, it was soon completely absorbed by Kion. Suddenly, Cheon opens his eyes, awakening from his ghost-induced trance. To the old man's surprise, the energy from Chion's body immediately begins to scatter throughout the room. Turning back, the old man saw Chion, who was removing the talisman from his forehead. Chion put his hand to the floor, after which streams of shadow began to creep from his fingers. The shocked old man watched as a silhouette formed from the darkness behind Chion. Turning around, Chion looked at the demon standing in front of him, who, expressing respect, folded his hands and greeted his master. Evening was falling on the street. A man was sitting on the steps on the way to the palace of the head of the clan, wondering if this was normal. General Manager Chang Myungan sighed heavily as he clasped his hands together. Myungan thought about the head of their clan, Mokindan, remembering that in his youth he was a true hero worthy of admiration. He remembered their meeting 20 years ago when they defeated the pirates at the Salty Lagoon. Then Myungan was the master of the Cholgan clan, and they united to defeat the pirates. After defeating the pirates, Myungan became a manager and swore allegiance to Mokindan, but now he wonders why everything turned out this way. Myungan remembered a conversation with Sok, who asked him if he really believed that a young man from the bottom could become the head of the clan. She continued by saying that this concerns the future of the Brotherhood of the Sword, because until the Taoist finds out where the sacred book and seal are, the head will not have an heir. Thinking that the spell could be a lie and that they could have tried to intimidate the gentleman from the very beginning, Myungan was languidly silent. Suddenly standing up from the steps, Myungan shouted that this shouldn't happen, clenching his fists. Thinking that what was happening was contrary to the principles of his lord, Myungan headed to the palace, deciding to sort everything out and return it to how it was. The monk looks towards Kaon with a look full of horror, thinking that this is not an ordinary soul in front of him. Looking at the massive demon standing next to Cheon, Myosin came to the conclusion that this was a supreme evil spirit. Kaon ordered the demon monk to kill Myosin, after which the Dumon then rushed to the old man. 
The old man barely had time to raise the barrier when the demon rushed in front of him. Myosin is shocked that Keon communicates with the demon as if he were an old acquaintance wondering who it is in front of him. Myosin's barrier could not withstand the demon's pressure, causing the demon to throw Myosin away, dispelling the spell. Smiling, the demon came closer and closer to Myosin, extending his hand to him. In a panic, the old man grabs a sword from a wall shelf, shouting at the demon to stay away. The demon attacks the old man, using the same curse that Kaon had previously experienced on himself. The arms entangled the old man, and Myosin screamed, begging Chion to spare him, saying that he would do anything. Kion only replies that he doesn't need Myosin, to which the old man believes that the reason is that Myosin deceived him. Kion says that it's not a matter of deception, but that the old man also heard about where the sacred book and seal lie. As the ghost pulled the old man deeper and deeper, Myosin realized what kind of brat Chion really was. When the ghost's hands completely enveloped Myosin, he finally realized that Chion had been planning to kill him from the very beginning. Chion looked outside the room, telling Go Chang, who was standing nearby, to follow him in. Kokan at first believes that everything is finally over, but upon entering the room, he is shocked. Myosin lay dead on the floor, blood still flowing from his eyes, mouth, and nose. Go Chang asked Chion if Myosin had died to which Chion replied to ask questions later and help remove the corpse instead. Swinging his sword and breaking furniture, Cheon tells Gochang that they will tell that Myosin went crazy and began to swing his sword, cutting off the master's hand at the same time. Cheon continued, saying that after the old man's rampage, they suddenly appear and stop him, while Gochang only silently picks up the corpse. Gokan asked Cheon if he wanted to hide what happened, to which Chan agreed by asking what the problem was. Kokan replied that the plan was very well thought out, but it would not be so easy to deceive Sayok, and even if nothing worked out, suspicion would fall on Chion. Kion asked if it really wouldn't work, to which Gochen replied even if it were made out that Myosin was going crazy, it wouldn't be easy to convince Sayok. Kion agrees with Gochan's idea, deciding that he needs to come up with something else, and then thinks about it. Suddenly, Chion pierces his leg with a sword, saying that he will say that the old man, having cut off the head's hand, tried to kill him too. Gokhan, not yet tired of being surprised by the madness of Qian's actions, shouts out asking what Qian is doing. Taking the sword out of his own leg, Qian asks Go Chang if this version is plausible enough. Kokan thought about the fact that although disguise is very important, Qian really pierced his leg without thinking. Gokhan, holding his twisted arm, tells Qian that he needs to stop the bleeding, to which Qian replied that the paler, the more believable. Well... Just as Kokan finished the thought that he would not want to be Cheon's enemy, the manager burst into the room. The manager looked around to see the wounded Kion, the dead Myosin in the head, missing an arm. The manager breaks down, shouting loudly and asking Cheon and Gochen what is happening. Kokan and Cheon answer in two voices that the manager misunderstood everything. Cheon stood up, twitching, heading towards the manager and holding out his bloody hand, saying that first you should pay attention to the head. After which Cheon fell to the floor like a sack of potatoes, leaving the head and Gochang in bewilderment. The manager attacked Gochang with questions about what was happening here and why the third son, Mokyongun, was here. Kohan, seeing that Chion fell to the floor and began to smile, realized that he was just pretending. After the incident, Chion was taken to the Sword Brotherhood's medical ward in the middle of the night. Lying in the ward with a bandaged leg, Chion thinks about how pleasant the smell of the herbs that are piled in the medical ward is. Then Chion noticed that the place the head named smelled even nicer. Kokan is also in the medical room with his hand fixed. Surrounded by many people, Cheon thinks that it is better to look for a book and a seal at night without prying eyes. Kokan entered the room in which Cheon lay, announcing his arrival, after which Kion immediately stood up. Cheon tells Gochang that he was late, after which Gochang takes out Miosin's books from under his clothes. Cheon wonders why there are only two of them. Kokan replies that these books were hidden because they were going to be burned. Kokan continued, saying that all the things of the Taoist master were burned by the guards, suggesting that this was how they got rid of evidence. Qian felt a little sad when he read that the books were called Paranormal Activity Volume 1 and Yin Yang School of Thought Original Volume. However, with a warm smile on his face, Qian thanked Gochen, saying that he did a great job, causing Gochen to wince. Qian asked what was wrong, to which Gochen replied that everything was fine, then asked what he wanted to find in the books. Cheon asks Gochan to look out the window, asking him to say what he sees there. Kokan replies that he sees nothing outside the window, although at that moment a spirit monk was hovering right in front of the window. Cheon tells Gochun that's why he wants to find out, but Gochang still doesn't understand what Cheon is talking about. 
Suddenly, Gohan and Qian, quickly hiding the books, hear a noise outside the door. Someone shouts, saying that they should not enter the room. Someone tells Mrs. Sayok that the young master has not yet recovered, but she only tells him to get out of sight. The door opened and Sayok came into the room, accompanied by her guards looking at Cheon. With a noticeable displeasure on his face, Sayok tells Kion that they should talk. Go Chang immediately bowed down and greeted her, addressing her as first madam, which surprised Cheon. Hearing that Gokan called her first, Cheon realized that this was the first wife from a family of hereditary military men, Mrs. Sayok. He also notes that Master Cam is an important person from her wing, and that she herself is a hereditary warrior and a woman of genius. Having come to the conclusion that the lady should beware more than the eldest son, Cheon bowed and greeted Sayok. Sitting on the bed in a bow, Cheon apologizes to Sayok, saying that he is still uncomfortable standing on his sore leg. Gokun, looking at the lady, came to the conclusion that it turned out better than he thought, saying that everything would work out if Cheon was just as resourceful. Sayok tells Cheon that she came here for a reason, which makes Cheon confused. Suddenly, Sayok strikes directly at the wound on Cheon's leg. Cheon screams in pain. Gochang only manages to be perplexed by the situation until bodyguard Sayok takes out the sword. Putting a sword to Gochang's throat, bodyguard Sayok ordered him not to move. Sayok praises Cheon, saying that the wound is real and that he managed to hurt himself for the sake of disguise. She continued by saying that the general manager believed him, adding that there was something he didn't know. Smiling, she said that a real Taoist never goes crazy from the ritual, but Cheon just remained silent. Laughing, Sook asked how a real Taoist could go crazy and run away. Hitting Cheon in the face, she asked him how he could lie to her so blatantly. With his blow, Sayok threw Cheon straight to the window, which Go Chang could only watch helplessly. Waving his hand, Sayok asked Cheon not to force her to repeat herself and to tell her what really happened. The wound on the leg of Cheon, who was leaning against the wall, was bleeding, but he just sat silently with his head bowed. Suddenly, to the surprise of everyone present, Cheon began to laugh, looking at the discouraged Sayok. Qian's laughter began to develop into maniacal laughter, looking at which Qian annoyedly asked if he had gone crazy. Kaon's laughter stopped, and raising his head, he pointed his finger in the direction of Sayok, giving an order to the demon monk. The demon monk immediately rushed through Sayok, the flow of wind from his flight ruffling Qian's hair. Not understanding what had happened, Juice began to look around, feeling as if something had rushed past her. Turning around, she saw how the eyes of everyone in the room were focused on the maid floating in the air. The image of the murdered Myosin flashed through Sok's head, and Sok realized that there was a ghost in front of her. Kian came close to Sayok, asking that she needed a book and a seal. While the ghost was strangling a maid named Sowa, Chion told Sayok that if she needs a book and a seal, then she needs to negotiate and not pointlessly threaten. Chion tells Sayok that she may not believe it, but he wants to live long, after which he says that Mok Yongho is not the only one who is going to become the head of the clan. Then he added that since she treats him like that, then perhaps he should turn to his older brother. Qian continued by saying that maybe he should meet his little brother, because even if they don't get along, maybe they should make peace. Qian asks if the lady now understands who the sword is hanging on, moving away from Sayok. Qian then said that it was quite cold outside today and that the lady should take care of herself. Returning to his chambers, Juice goes on a rampage, throwing furniture around the room out of impotence. Trampling a wooden chair with his foot, Sayok shouts, asking how Cheon dares to behave so impudently. Sayok continues to destroy furniture, saying that Cheon is impudent and a scoundrel, after which her bodyguard asks Sayok to calm down. Juice asks the bodyguard that in her opinion, Juice is not calm after this upstart fooled her, to which the bodyguard only remains silent. Sayok thinks about how she could have been led, believing that if something intimidates Cheon, he will become nervous and tremble with fear, not understanding why everything has changed so much. Looking at the box, Juice thinks that everything that is happening is quite strange, as if the third son had been replaced. Suddenly, she wondered what if he was actually hiding his true nature. She recalls that at his age, the third son was a very gifted young man. However, after the death of his mother and grandmother, things only got worse, wondering if this was his way of protecting himself. Seok realizes that she should not have let her guard down no matter what happened, after which the maid tells Seok that they must finish off Mokyungun before he cheats. Juice does not agree, saying that if the book and printing are transferred to someone else, it will be much worse. But then Sayok says that he still doesn't want Kion to pursue her. Then he tells the maid to report the death of Master Myosin in the chambers of the head of the clan. Hearing Sok's words, the shocked maid immediately remembers that Myosin was part of a group of Taoist monks. Sayok, smiling mysteriously, thinks that he won't let Mokyungun go just like that. 
Midnight in the medical ward, Qian studied the books he had received, reading the Yin Yang School of Thought, which talked about the images of ghosts. Sitting in the dark by the lantern, Qian continued to read about how the shape of a ghost depends on different conditions. The first type is Zhongnyon, which can cause chills and goosebumps with its presence. The second is Churyong, which can make a person feel pain and heaviness. The third is Huanyon, who becomes deadly and should be feared because meeting him ends in painful death. Suddenly, a demon monk emerges from the medical ward counter right in front of Qian. Qian asked the demon monk if he had ever encountered such people, to which he nodded, after which Qian assumed that the demon monk was Huan Yong. Reaching his hand towards the door of the little-used medicine, Qian noticed that the ghost's abilities were useful for walking through dungeon walls. However, he remembered that the ghost's power did not work on juice and he had to use it on the maid. Opening the door, Qian remembers that he previously managed to use the power of a ghost on Go Chang. Suddenly, the secret passage behind the shelves with medicines opened with a roar. Approaching the passage, Qian thinks that suddenly the ghost's power does not affect Seok, since she is a first-class master. Opening the book again, Qian thinks that it wouldn't hurt to find a stronger monster. Reading about the fourth type of Nanyan, which can intimidate by inspiring voices. Delighted with the find, Qian took a lantern and approached the stairs leading to the dungeon. Pointing the lantern in front of him, Qian intended to go in search of the book and seal. Going down for quite a long time, Qian admitted that it was quite deep here, and all in order to hide the seal and writing. Continuing to descend, Qian thought that this is probably why everyone is running with their eyes burning, because it would be nice to get the scripture and seal into their own hands. Qian thought that apparently the power of the demon monk would not affect Master Kam, and therefore he would need other trump cards against him. Entering the small wooden gate, Qian found himself in a huge cave. In front of him was a rise to a platform on which five doors were located. Having passed through the right door, Qian found himself in an even larger cave, the edge of which was not visible from the entrance. Qian wonders if the scripture and seal were hidden too far away. When suddenly, Qian's foot sinks slightly into the ground, activating the pressure plate. Hearing the roar, Kion raised his head, seeing a giant boulder falling on top of him. Having hardly jumped away from the boulder on the chain, the stone crashes into the ground with enormous force, cracking into fragments. Landing on the ground, Chion says that these are the expected traps, while at the same time activating the stove again. This time, Kion easily managed to dodge the trap of the releasing arrow. Chion shot down the rest of the arrows fired by the trap with the help of a lantern, waving it like a flail. The last arrow almost hits him in the head, but Cheon manages to cover himself with a lantern, causing the arrow to stick into him. Cheon says that now he is playing big, watching as a block of stone tied with ropes to the ceiling rushes towards him. Cheon jumps onto a block flying at him from above, thinking that there are too many traps for a dungeon. The block hits the wall, Cheon jumping off it wonders whether the holy scripture is worth it, from which one comes to the conclusion that something more important than scripture is hidden behind the traps. A lot of blades, spears, and other sharp objects tied on chains fall on Qian from above. Having dodged the sharp objects on the chains, Qian wonders what exactly is being guarded by so many traps. Qian passes the passage filled with dangers, leaving behind triggered traps. Coming out to a certain hall, Qian exhaled, saying that now the traps were definitely over. Walking inside, Qian thinks that he did not expect to see any buildings in the dungeon. Looking around the hall illuminated by the light of a lantern, Qian wonders if life was in full swing here before and training was conducted. Walking through the hall, Qian approached the table on which lay a closed box. Opening the box, he saw two books in it, The Brotherhood of the Sword, The Basics of Fencing, and The Brotherhood of the Sword, The Path to Knowledge. Qian remembers that Go Chang told him that the scripture consists of the basics of fencing and the path to knowledge, after which he takes both books. Looking around, Qian thinks that the room is somehow too empty given its size. Qian went to one of the corners, in which there was a massive wooden box. As Qian approached, he saw that it was a platform, and heavier than usual, and that, judging by the traces, it had been moved often. Qian moves the podium, wondering if they really wanted to hide something with its help. Moving the podium aside, Qian confirms his fears, seeing a hole on the wall sealed with seals. Having broken the seals and opened the hatch, Qian sees a container inside. This container turns out to be a chest, which, like the hatch, is sealed with several seals. While removing the seals, Cheon thinks that he feels an ominous energy, that it was clearly not scripture that they wanted to hide here. As soon as Cheon opened the chest, the flame in his lantern inexplicably went out. 
Without having time to think about why his lamp went out, Cheon looks into the chest and freezes. Cheon took out a leather-bound book from the chest, entangled with red beads, and Cheon immediately realized that this was not just a book. From its pungent smell and texture, Cheon realized that it was covered with human skin. Someone inflamed by the shouts of the crowd beats the drum with wooden sticks. A nobleman who bears a suspicious resemblance to Cheon dances in a circle of musicians and onlookers. The dancing nobleman turned out to be the second candidate, named Mokun Pyong. Approaching the window, Mokun Pyong is happy about the party going on, saying that thanks to it, the Brotherhood Palace looks much brighter today. With a smug smile, he says that it's probably because he will soon become the head of the clan. Behind him is the silhouette of a man whom Mokun Pyong thanks for his successful future. This man turns out to be Master Kam, whom Mokun Pyong welcomes with open arms. Kam bows, telling Mokun Pyong that he is glad to see the second young master. It's night, illuminated by moonlight, and Mo Gun Pyong apologizes to Kam for keeping him waiting. He continued saying that he wanted to have a party in honor of a good man, saying that even if his father is in bed, this is not a reason to cancel the meeting. Kam thanks Mo Gun Pyong, saying that he is very kind, to which he laughs, telling Kam to go ahead. When the moon was completely hidden behind the clouds, people began to leave the hall, signaling the end of the party. Mo Kyung Pyong grinningly asks Kam if Mo Kyung Gun really lost his skills. Kam, with a gloomy look, reasoned that the original was already dead, and the double had not yet been trained, noting that he was not lying now. In addition, Kam did not want to reveal that Cheon was only a double, because then he would get it because he failed to protect Mok Yung-gun. Thinking that he does not intend to dance to Cheon's tune, Kam replies that Mok Yung-gun has really lost all his skills. Mo Gun Pyong grins, saying that this idiot is so incompetent that he has lost his fighting skills. Laughing, Mok Gun Pyong told Kam that thanks to him, he had gained mastery asking if he should thank him, to which Kam also laughed. Mok Yong Pyong asked Kam if he would like to tell him why Mok Yong Gun lost his skills. Sitting on a chair, Mo Kun Pyong said that even if Kam himself was to blame, he would forgive him, because everyone makes mistakes. Kam replied that he couldn't tell yet, for which he apologized, thinking that if the truth came out, he would have to clean up after Mok Gun Pyong. Then he added that Mok Kun Pyong was not in danger, which made him laugh, saying that he would believe Kam. After which, with a sly smile, he added that Kam was, after all, one of the same kind of killers, which put Kam into a stupor. Mokin Pyong asked Kam what was the matter, while Kam was thinking that he had always considered his interlocutor, albeit an evil one, to be a child. When suddenly Mokun Pyong leaned closer to Kam, and with a smile on his face asked if this was also a secret. Thinking that Mokun Pyong had decided to delve into his past, Kam then responded with tears in his eyes that everything was wrong. Smirking and grunting, Mogun Pyong told Kam that he could leave and that he would call him later. Mogun Pyong stood at the window, looking at Master Kam as he left into the night. Mogun Pyong told the two people behind him that Kam has something to hide, which means he knows something about Mok Yong Gun. He orders one of his henchmen named Cho Il San to follow Mok Yong Gun, saying that Kam is hiding the reason for the loss of his skill, and Cho is close to the first circle. Cho asked Mogun Pyong if he should just follow up. Mok Gun Pyong replies that it's not interesting, saying that if he comes to him, then let him break his leg. Meanwhile, Kion was still standing in the hall, holding a strange book made of human flesh in his hands. Cheon thinks that the pulsation coming from the book was not an illusion, adding that the fact that it does not feel alive is ironic. Suddenly, Cheon's eyes widened. He clearly felt that the pulse emanating from the book was nothing more than a dying pulsation. Wondering how this thing ended up here, Cheon decides it's time to unwind the beads and see what's written on it. Suddenly, a violet flame mixed with black energy appears behind Kion. A demon monk emerged from the fire whom Kion did not expect to see because he did not call him. Kion asked the demon monk approaching him what was the matter. As soon as the demon monk saw the book, he immediately fell to one knee bowing. Looking at the demon monk, Kion could not believe that the ghost was really reacting to the book like that because fear was clearly visible in him. At this moment, Kion was once again convinced that the book in front of him was clearly special. However, Kaon puts the book back in the chest, thinking that since the demon monk is here, then there is someone else nearby. Looking up, Xion realizes that apparently an uninvited guest is heading towards his room. A silhouette in a cloak was quickly approaching Xion's room, briskly galloping along the roofs. Stopping on a tree near Xion's mansion, the man noticed Go Chang yawning. Jumping away from the tree, Cho wondered what Ko Chan was doing on the street and why he wasn't guarding the wounded gentleman. Wondering if Mok Yung Gun was really hiding something, Cho looked out the window, surprised by what he saw. In the room, he saw Cheon lying on the bed, apparently sleeping. 
Making his way into the room, Cho thought, if he was sleeping, then why did he send Kokon on guard? Intending to check the chi of the sleeping Chion, Cho's gaze suddenly stops at a book lying on the table. Cho is shocked, because this book turned out to be holy scripture, the basics of fencing of the Brotherhood of the Sword. Frantically leafing through the scripture, Cho realizes with horror that he is holding the original in his hands. Cho at first wonders how Mok Yung-gun managed to find him, but immediately decides that it doesn't matter, because with the writing they will certainly win. But Cho, who was engrossed in the holy scripture, did not notice how Kion crept up to him. Grabbing Cho by the head, Chion immediately hit his head on the table with such force that the tea utensils flew into the air. Chion asked Cho what he was doing in his room, joking that Cho must have come to sleep. Cho thought that Chion was apparently pretending to be asleep, while Kion replied that he could help him, after which he continued to slam Cho's head into the table. Cho only has time to think that Mok Yung-gun is a real madman, and after another hit of his head on the table, he passes out. Cho came to his senses after some time. His broken nose was smeared with blood. When Cho woke up, he saw an upside-down Chion in front of him, asking if he had woken up. Having finally come to his senses, Cho, suspended above by the Naga, began to fidget and scream, asking where they were. Kian, ignoring Cho's questions, took out a knife and plunged it into the floor in front of Cho's surprised face. Rolling up his sleeves and a sadistic smile on his face, Cheon asked the terrified Cho if he wanted to chat. Cho lies on the floor with a broken face, coughing from difficulty breathing with a broken nose. Go Chung exclaimed in surprise. Cheon asked if he knew him. Go Chung replied that in front of them was Cho il -sun, one of the three guards of the second son. Kian is surprised, asking why the second son's guard came to him. Gochin replies that he doesn't know, but believes that if Cho entered wearing a mask, then he probably had good intentions. Kian throws Cho's body on his shoulders, telling Ko Chan that he should then tell everything himself. Go Chang objected with a shout, saying that if Chian was going to torture him, then it was better to leave him alone. Gohan replied that Cho was still Mok Gun Pyong's guard, and that it would be bad for him if Chian harmed someone from his circle, to which Chian only twisted his hand. On his knees, Gochan shouts out to Chion not to carry Cho into that room, because it is very dangerous. Falling on his back from powerlessness, Kokan turns over and says that he no longer understands anything. Exhaling, Kochan thinks that Chion may not kill Cho, because for all his cruelty, he is smart, looking at what happened to the head of the clan. Hanging upside down in front of Chion, Cho tells Chion to untie him. Chion, not understanding this request, asks Cho why he should do this. Cho replies that since Chion saw his face, he must know that he is here on Mok Gun Pyong's orders, after which he asks if Chion thinks that he can get away with everything. Cho continued telling Cheon not to irritate him and just give him the book, and he would tell Mok Gun Pyong that Cheon spared him, thinking that Cheon intended to torture him. Smirking at Cho, Cheon just looked down, answering that he was saying interesting things. Taking the knife out of the floor, Cheon replies that he heard that Mok Gun Pyong is terribly worried about his subordinates, because even now, he trusts his master and boasts. Chion walks behind Cho, saying that so be it, he will let him go, to which Cho replies that this is a wise decision. Cho didn't have time to say that he would tell his master about Chion's act, when he suddenly noticed blood dripping onto the floor. Kion, holding the severed index finger in his hands, asked Cho to answer him whose finger it was. Cho, looking at his bleeding hand, thinks that if Chion cut off his finger, then why doesn't he feel pain? Suddenly Cho realized that he could not move and could not feel Chi. Kion answers the thoughtful Cho that it's a matter of hallucinations from a mixture of herbs, after a couple of injections of which Cho will no longer feel his body, after which he says that he will ask a couple of questions. Cheon, raising a knife in front of him, says that for silence he will cut off one finger at a time. Cheon asks the first question why Mok Gun Pyong sent him. Smirking, Cheon raises the knife, saying that the report begins right now. Immediately after the report begins, Cheon cuts off Cho's finger, to which he shouts, Just wait. Chion replied that Cho was silent, after which he decided to continue and cut off the second finger. Cho shouted that Chion was a bastard, demanding to stop, to which Chion cut off his third finger. Chion already cut off the fourth finger, after which Cho shouted just enough. Cho screamed pitifully, begging Chion to stop, spraying blood in all directions. Smiling, Chion asked Cho, surprised by his reaction, asking whether to cut off his thumb as well. Cho replied that Mok Gun Pyong sent him to find out that Mok Yong Gun had lost his skills. Cho sighs helplessly while Cheon just silently looks at Cho, thinking about what he heard. Thinking about Cho's answer, Cheon thought that Cho was investigating his loss of skills. Thinking that everything had changed quickly, Cheon asked the next question. It was Master Kam who told them this. Cho said that it was, 
after which Chion asked if he had deprived him of turning on his brain, saying that who knew that they would not find out the whole story. Cho is shocked that Chion realized so quickly that Master Kam is a traitor, wondering if Chion is really that smart and suspected him from the very beginning, or if Kam was a spy. Chion stood up turning to Cho and saying that he had no more questions. Looking at Cho, Chion asks him what they should do now. Cho looked at Chion, his whole appearance showing that Chion was not going to let him go alive. Suddenly, Cho shouts out that he swears allegiance to Kion, which disarms Chion. Cho shouts out that he couldn't even think that the third master was so smart, saying that only he deserves to be the head of the clan. Cho continues saying that he is ready to do anything, even give his life for him. Kion agrees to Cho's surprise, saying that he needs to do one little thing. Kion asked if Cho could help him, to which, thinking that he had survived, Cho shouted out enthusiastic agreement, saying that he just needed to order. Before Cho could finish his plea, Cheon stuck a knife into his throat. Smirking at Cho, who was choking on blood, Cheon said that Cho was ready to give his life. After which, pulling the dagger out of his throat, he answered that then Cho would lend him some blood. Choking on blood, Cho's last thoughts were about what a scum Cheon is. Taking the book in his hands, Cheon said that he could not forcefully untie the rosary that covered it, believing that it was a seal from the book of the yin-yang school of thought. Moving the box under the blood flowing from Cho, Chion says that the seal will weaken if unclean blood is poured on it. The blood of the unjustly killed Cho Ilsan flowed down, penetrating the beads and wetting the book. The blood continued to flow onto the book when Chion suddenly felt something ominous. The beads on the book cracked and shattered, releasing the book and spattering blood. Chion looks at the now free book, wondering who will come to him now. Suddenly, blood bursts out of the box, hitting Chion's legs in a violent stream. Cho's body is thrown away and blood splashes throughout the room, covering every wall. Suddenly, streams of blood again gather directly above the book, forming a kind of whirlpool. The blood thickens, turning into a tissue-like substance, creating a cocoon in which a human silhouette can be seen. The silhouette glows brightly, splashing blood in all directions, causing Keon to cover himself with his hands. When the wind flows towards him died down, Cheon removed his hands and looked at what appeared before him. The hall seemed to have become another dimension. The entire floor was covered in blood, and a figure froze in front of Cheon from under whose robes only a leg was visible. The creature wrapped in fabric began to slowly approach Tian without touching the floor with its feet. A blonde-haired, red-eyed woman wrapped in cloth and with a hat on her head appeared before Tian. Tian looked at the woman in front of him in shock, realizing that this did not look like Nanyang. Tian thinks that according to the book, the fifth type of ghosts appeared before him. The blue spirit, he is Cheong Yan. Tian thought that he expected Nanyang to be in front of him, but he was lucky and his knees immediately gave way. Cheon fell to his knees in front of the ghost who called Cheon just a stupid child. The ghost told Cheon to empty his soul and show her his true nature. Cheon remembered that the book said that Cheong Yon is capable of exerting a significant influence in a certain radius, causing pain and hallucinations, and to fight them you need at least ten Taoist masters. The ghost looked at Cheon in surprise, asking if he was a fool for still not emptying his soul. Having tensed, Cheon thought that, judging by the book, this was the same ghost. Smiling, he realized that now it was clear why, but said that now he was interested. The ghost asked Cheon what he saw so interesting. Cheon replied that the size, status, or strength of the body does not matter. The ghost will do anything that seems funny to him. Cheon continued, saying ghosts are helpless if they don't have a vessel. Cheon said that if the spirit wants his body, then he will have to take it by force. To Cheon's words, the spirit immediately responded by hitting him with a stream of blood. Cheon was surprised by the ghost's attack, which hit his side, leaving only a hole. The wounded Cheon fell groaning in pain, but the ghost only arrogantly called Cheon a stupid mortal. The spirit immediately dealt another blow with blood, but this time on Cheon's face. Having removed the skin from half of Cheon's face with a blow, the spirit asked whether Cheon had to force her. The spirit asked if Cheon now understands that he will not be able to do anything. The spirit continued, saying that Qian only needs to obediently offer his soul. Despite the ghost's attacks, Qian out of breath was still able to stand on his feet. The ghost was surprised that the guy managed to resist, even when she tore off half of his face with her attack, saying that he was not a simple brat. However, she continued that it didn't matter, lifting Qian up by his arms and legs and pinning him to the post. The spirit offered Qian a deal. If his soul obeys her, she will fulfill one of his wishes. When asked why she needs this, the spirit replies that this is payment, because if she continues to cripple Keon, she will damage his soul. Keon asked what would happen if he refused, and the spirit replied that she would kill him and find a new soul. 
Kion, with a peaceful face, tells the ghost that he has something he wants. The spirit began to question enthusiastically, saying that his anger showed that he had never lived an ordinary life, asking if someone had killed his family member or betrayed him. The spirit continued saying that she would tear anyone into small pieces and that his soul would leave this world, after which he ordered Kion to name his wish. Kion, with a blissful smile on his face, says that he wants her to shut up and become his ward. The angry spirit raised pillars of blood, telling Cheon to try and endure it. Calling Cheon a short-sighted creature, the ghost unleashed all her power on Cheon. Cheon plunged into a bloody whirlpool, while the spirit asked if he could withstand the pain when his flesh was torn and his bones were broken. Watching Cheon in the bloody hurricane, the spirit says that she is sorry that his soul is a little spoiled. Swimming in the streams of blood, Cheon thinks that this taste is redder than cherries, thicker and dirtier, disgusting, with a metallic aftertaste. All his senses tell Cheon this is indeed blood, but Cheon understands that this taste is not the same as he knows it. It is different. He remembers that as a demon with a scythe, he tried a lot of blood. He asked himself if it tasted like this then, remembering that the trembling and warmth made him feel alive. And now, all he feels is death. The ghost is shocked that Cheon managed to overcome her deception. Cheon realized that in front of him was only an illusion, after which he interrupted the ghost's deception. The ghost was thrown with force into the wall so that she only groaned in pain. The ghost looked in shock at Kaon, who was standing in the middle of the room with his back to her. Looking at him, the ghost only thought that what happened was simply impossible. The ghost creates a butterfly from blood and then points it towards Kion. Having flown to Chion, the butterfly becomes only a bloody stain on his cheek. The ghost realizes with irritation that Chion is now in a state of sensory freedom. Freedom of the senses is a Taoist technique that removes all sensations and allows you to leave hallucinations by deceiving your five senses. The spirit thinks that it sounds much simpler than it actually is, which is why he does not understand how a child managed to do it, who is not even a master of Taoism. Looking at Kion, she wonders if he was really born with all the qualities of a Taoist master. Kion, looking at the spirit, laughed as hard as he could. The spirit, irritated by Kiona's arrogance, asked if, having escaped from hallucinations, he decided that he could cope with her. Chion closed his eyes and then answered from under his brows that a funny thought had come to his mind. Kion showed the book to the spirit, causing her face to noticeably change. A book from the yin-yang school of thought says that the older the monster, the more likely it is that it has a vessel to which it is connected. Why does Kion come to the conclusion that this book is the vessel of the spirit, after which he bites off a piece of it? By tearing a piece from the book, Chion caused the ghost incredible pain, causing her to scream loudly. Kion, convinced that he was right, continued to tear and gnaw the cover of the book. The ghost is shocked that a mortal had the courage to do such a thing, thinking that before no one could damage a book endowed with a terrifying amount of chi. Even outstanding masters could barely seal the book, causing the ghost to reply to Chion that he had angered her. The ghost rushed at Chion, grabbing him by the throat and pressing him against the column. Looking angrily at Chion, the spirit told him to try and say that this was also a hallucination. The spirit continued saying that she no longer needed his soul, and that Kion cursed his stupidity for refusing her mercy. Chion said that it's strange that she still hasn't taken the book from him, and wonders why. Looking into the annoyed face of the ghost, Chion says that as he thought, the spirit should not touch her. Having concluded his conclusion, Chion began to chew the bitten-off piece of the book, from which the ghost ordered him to stop. Starting to choke Chion, the spirit ordered him to immediately spit out a piece of the book. Chion, swallowing the flesh from the book, realizes that the blood that previously got into him is rampant and flows in the opposite direction. Pain runs through Kion's body, reminding him of the first time he ate poisonous herbs, but brighter than the pain, he felt the wrath of the evil spirit. The spirit cried out that Kion, a crazy mortal, while Kion felt a strong desire for revenge. Kion still managed to swallow a piece of the book, after which suddenly both he and the spirit were overcome by a strange feeling. Suddenly, Cheon found himself in the middle of a city blazing with scarlet flames. Asking where he was, Cheon looked around, seeing only a field strewn with many corpses. In the middle of the field, Cheon also saw a spirit kneeling in front of a certain person on the throne. The wounded kneeling spirit looked with anger at the figure sitting on the throne. Tearing off pieces of his robe, the spirit tied the blade to his hands, unable to hold it on his own. Pointing the sword at the figure on the throne, the spirit said something that Cheon could not hear. Kion couldn't hear her words, but he clearly felt her all-encompassing rage. With tears in her eyes, the spirit pointed her blade at the man on the throne. The man sitting on the throne, with horns on his head, just grinned. The spirit immediately rushed with rage at the one sitting on the throne, shouting something incomprehensible. 
However, the one sitting on the throne with a quick movement struck the spirit in the chest, splashing its blood. The horned one tore his hand out of the ghost's chest, thereby completely depriving her of the opportunity to fight. From the wound she received, the spirit fell from the pedestal into a bloody puddle on the ground. She, lying exhausted on the ground, was immediately surrounded by many people in robes. The people surrounding her with burning eyes raised their daggers. Under the blood moon, people struck blow after blow, splashing spirit blood everywhere. In the place where the spirit's body lay, only her hair remained and the book that appeared. Kion opened his eyes when he heard a sharp scream next to him. Kion didn't understand what kind of scream it was, after which he noticed a red thread sticking out of his chest. Kion discovered that the source of the scream was a spirit, screaming that she had become his familiar. Under his malicious smile and the thought that he now has a blue spirit, the ghost shouted that this cannot be real. Dissatisfied with this outcome, the spirit immediately attacks Cheon, again grabbing him by the throat and pressing him against the column, demanding his release. But before she can finish speaking, a pain in her throat hinders her speech. With annoyance, the spirit leaves Cheon, who at this time believes that the familiar feels the same pain as his master. Suddenly, Kion wonders how the demonic monk feels there, because in fact he has just been resurrected, while the monk himself did not look particularly happy. Kion turned to the ghost, telling her that since they were now together for a long time, why don't they introduce themselves, to which the spirit only silently smoked. Kion introduced himself as Mok Yung Gun, asking the ghost what he should call her. Having not heard an answer from the ghost, Kion continued, saying that apparently he can call her whatever he wants. With a mocking expression on his face, Cheon calls the ghost a red dung beetle. The provocation worked, and the ghost responded, telling Cheon that he was crazy. Cheon laughed, asking that the spirit did not like such a nickname, which made the spirit ask how dare he play with her. Cheon asked that if she didn't like the name he suggested, why didn't she give her own? To which the spirit replied that she didn't have a name for mere mortals. Cheon, realizing that there is nowhere to go and needs to give the ghost a name, remembers that there was Cheong Nyon in the Book of Ghosts and gives the ghost this name, after which she tells the ghost that from now on she will call her Cheong Nyon. However, this does not change Cheong Nyon's attitude towards Cheon at all, which is why Cheon understands that he will have to approach her differently. Picking up the book from the floor, Cheon asked Cheong Nyon if she knew what was written in it, to which the spirit replied that she didn't know, asking what Cheong Nyon was. Waving the phone, Cheong Yeon says that he doesn't know anything, adding that she's busy and that he shouldn't distract her. Opening the book, Cheon saw that all the text inside was written in blood and finds it funny that a book made of leather was written in blood. While reading, Cheon comes to the conclusion that the local scriptures are too abstract and delusional without understanding what the meaning is. Looking at Cheon's blank face, the spirit turned around giggling, finding it funny. Seeing Cheon Yeon's giggling face, Chion realized that she didn't want to tell anything, deciding that if you want to do something well, then do it yourself. Peering at the book, Chion read the lines in which nothingness and hopelessness, a strange shape and deep volume are written. Hearing Chion's words, Chion Yon turned around warily as Chion began to read out the names Mojong Kosan and Musan Hyunwijon. Suddenly, energy began to envelop Chion, who continued to read what was written in the book. Chion read another line, Maga and Hago, surrounded by streams of energy. After saying Yoki Mugigyul, Cheon suddenly felt changes in the book in his hands. Feeling the spine of the book, Cheon felt that the book had hardened. Cheong Nyon suddenly intervened, shouting at Cheon Wu to stop. With a face full of surprise, Cheong Nyon asked how Cheon managed to perform the ritual. Not understanding what was going on, Cheon asked the spirit if the book had anything to do with what was happening. When suddenly Cheon felt the impact of dark energy, which is why he immediately became distorted in an agony of pain. Seeing the impact on herself, Cheong Yeon was shocked by what was happening. The spirit immediately shouted to Cheon to quickly even out her breathing, seeing how he clutched his chest. She tells Cheon to clear his mind and not think about anything, to which Cheon just bites his lip. Concentrating, Cheon froze in place with his eyes closed while the book, as if stuck to his hand, hung down with its spine. Suddenly, the book became detached from Cheon's hand, falling down, and the dark veins on his hands began to disappear. Cheong Yun was surprised that Cheon managed to guess the image of the book so quickly. Thinking that it's a miracle that a guy who doesn't know martial arts was able to awaken the scripture at all, Cheong Yun says that she's never seen anything like this before. Sitting down on the steps, Cheon says that he thought he would die of suffocation, asking Cheong Yun what it was. The spirit answered Cheon, saying that he was unable to stabilize the fusion ritual because he was breathing incorrectly. Smiling, Cheon asked if Cheong Yun was telling the truth now. 
The spirit immediately burst into dissatisfaction, saying that she was simply afraid that Chion would drag them both to the grave with his antics. Kaon asked what kind of ritual this was, to which the spirit replied that it was something you sucked out and combined energy, but nothing came of it because there was emptiness inside Chion. Pointing to the corpse, the spirit invites Chion to try the spell on it. Kion asked whether it was necessary to use a spell on a corpse, to which the spirit answered correctly, adding that it was necessary to cast a spell below the stomach, believing that since he had died, he had lost energy. When Chion asked if they should touch below the navel, Cheong Yon asked if he needed to chew everything at all. When Cheon touched the corpse, Cheong Yon told him to read the spell again. Concentrating, Cheon began to cast the spell again, being once again enveloped in energy. Having finished reading the spell, Cheon felt a sharp surge of energy emanating from his body. Cheon felt the energy flow into the vessels on his palms and envelop his entire body with warmth. After starting to smoke, Cheong Yong told Cheon to pull on something and let it connect, even if it was spirit. Cheong Yon asked Cheon if he felt the energy, saying that this was the fusion ritual. Warm energy engulfed Cheon's stomach and he felt Chi, finally understanding what Go Chang was telling him. Cheon remembered that Go Chang said that collecting Chi energy takes a long time, after which he wonders whether it would be easier to take it from other people because this way he can quickly gain strength. Suddenly, Cheon felt that the warmth he felt began to rapidly dissipate. Cheon asked Cheong Yon if he was losing energy, to which she replied that it should be so because qi tends to dissipate. Cheong Yon continued that this is why it needs to be accumulated using breathing techniques, and then the energy will not be dissipated and will be collected in the body. However, the qi energy collected by this method is unique, since it does not mix with foreign qi. Cheong Yon summed it up by saying that in this way, Qian will not be able to accumulate qi energy through the fusion ritual. The distressed Qian says that he hoped that he had found a loophole, to which Cheong Yon grins, asking if he thought that becoming a master was so easy. But Qian Yan immediately reassured Qian, saying that the merger ritual was quite enough for him, which Xian did not understand. She continued, saying that the first of the eight formulas of the ritual is the main one, and having learned at least one formula, you can endlessly experiment with it. Qian Yong added that although Qi dissipates quickly, it is still energy, telling Qian to concentrate it in his hands and circulate it, Qian's misunderstanding written on his face. Cheong Yon told Qian to imagine energy, saying that circulation, just like writing, depends on the imagination, saying that by managing to circulate Qian, he will be able to cope with Qi. Cheong Yon immediately thought that Qian would not succeed, because without understanding there is no point in circulation, and Qian lacks skills. Suddenly, Qian concentrated and streams of Qi energy began to envelop him, concentrating on his palms. Cheong Yon, who definitely did not expect that Qian Wu would immediately be able to circulate Qi, was surprised by what she saw. Circulating the Qi in his hand, Qian clenched it into a fist and hit the pillar in the hall, leaving huge cracks. Qian's blow turned out to be so strong that one was enough to demolish the column, throwing it aside. Cheong Yun was perplexed by such an unthinkable, not understanding how Qian managed to imagine everything so quickly. Qian, satisfied with the result of the Qi concentration strike test, admired his own strength. Still confused, Cheong Yon looked at Qian trying to understand what the hell she saw. She thought that she had seen many talents, but this was the first time she saw someone with such good instincts, wondering where he came from. Turning to Cheong Yon, Qian said that everyone has their own reasons for practicing martial arts, saying that this way it will become much easier to kill people. Cheong Yon was surprised at first and thought that Qian understood exactly the essence of martial arts, because enlightenment and dreams are just nonsense since the true essence is how effectively you can kill. Qian asked Qian Yon what the second formula of infinite order was, and she practically answered him. However, Qian suddenly says that the kid practically deceived her, saying that he won't do everything for him. Qian Yon thought about the fact that she talks too much next to someone who learns so quickly, understanding why old people usually complain about their students. Qian asked Qian Yon again, expecting an answer, but all he hears in response is a request not to talk to her. Qian is annoyed that he did not receive answers to his questions, but he feels something in his hand. He thought about it, because Qian is sure that the property of Qi is that it dissipates, wondering what kind of cold energy he feels. Looking at Cheong Yon, Qian wonders if he should ask her about this energy. But she immediately decides not to ask, thinking that she won't answer anyway. Deciding that it would be more interesting to find out everything himself, Qian tells Cheong Yon that it's time for them to leave. Moonlight in the night illuminated the facade of the building, which resembled a temple. 
A woman from Lady Sock's guard named Hoenn arrived at this temple on the orders of her mistress. Standing at the entrance of the massive pagoda, Hoenn assumed that this was the same ghostly palace. Opening the doors, many sculptures appeared in front of Hoenn, at the head of which stood a statue of a monk. Tensing, Hoenn wonders why so many wooden sculptures are placed haphazardly around the room. Suddenly a fire lit up on a small pedestal in front of her, to which Hoenn eloquently remained silent. Hoenn said that as indicated in the letter, Master Miocian died due to the anger of the third son of Makyongan. Putting down the purse of gold, Hoenn said that this was compensation from the lady, and added that they would add more if their request was accepted. Slightly nervous, Hoenn said that their request was to get rid of Makyongun, and then asked if they would accept the request. The atmosphere in the temple suddenly became oppressive, as if some forces were influencing it. Suddenly the flame on the pedestal went out to Hoenn's surprise. Expressing respect and gratitude, Hoenn replied that she hoped her request would be fulfilled. Coming out of the temple, Hoenn shuddered, thinking that even though there was no one inside, she could not shake the feeling that she was being watched adding that she would definitely not return there without instructions. Meanwhile, inside the temple, Myosin's body lay on a table, right in front of a huge statue. Suddenly, figures in robes with hidden faces appear around the body. One of the monks says that this is definitely a murder. Other monks came out from behind the statues one after another, one of whom said that judging by the words in the letter, the maid was hovering in the air, which means that it is Huan Yon. The monks argue about whether the third son is possessed, or whether the spirit may have become his familiar. Having come to the conclusion that it is impossible to make a familiar into a spirit, the monks believe that the matter is much more dangerous than it seems. The head monk summed up the discussion by saying that one of those present would destroy Mokyongun from the Brotherhood of the Sword. Having said that this way Miosin's soul would rest, the chief monk gave an order to be carried out by a certain figure named Zhang Mion. Morning came and the sun's rays fell on the roofs of the buildings of the Brotherhood Fortress. A dissatisfied Gokhan wanders towards Qian's room, saying that he didn't sleep all night, but as soon as he took a nap, he was immediately called to a task. Going into Qian's room, Gochang said that he brought everything that Qian asked for, thinking that he was trying to do everything in his power and address Qian with respect. Gochang lit a fire in the stove he had brought earlier at Qian's request. Sitting down to warm his hands by the fire, Gochang asked why Qian needed to bake, to which he replied that he wanted to burn something. Kokhan was surprised that Cheon wanted to burn nothing more than that very scripture of the Brotherhood before he could get an answer to the question of why he wanted to burn it. Go Chang watched as Cheon tore out pages from the scripture. Screaming in a frenzy, Go Chang could only watch as Cheon burned the scripture page by page. Looking at the pleased Cheon, Go Chang cannot believe that this psycho really burned the scripture. Having finished burning the first book, watched by a shocked Go Chang, Cheon intended to continue. Suddenly, Gochen breaks down and asks Cheon what he is doing, loudly but in a respectful manner. With tears in his eyes, Gochen says that many people dream of at least looking at the cover of the scripture, asking how one can burn it, even if he wants to hide the martial art. Throwing the book at Gochang's face, Cheon said that that's why he had to burn everything. Cheon replied that he would use the arts in this way, to which Gochang asked again, how is it? Qian pointed his finger at his temple, telling Gochang that all the secrets of martial art are now located here. Getting ready to leave, Qian told Gochang to give the scripture to Mrs. Seok and the second son at dawn. Looking at Gochang's incomprehensible face, Qian added that he himself said that everyone wants to get them, noting that he likes such a family idol. With a face sparkling with cunning, Qian said that sharing the scripture with them would be just wonderful. The morning dawn flooded the roofs of the pagoda and houses with its radiance. Someone enthusiastically makes his bed, that his morning is fleeting, and that as soon as he wakes up, he quickly gets dressed and makes his bed. This someone turns out to be Master Cam, who, having cleaned the room, checks his to-do list for the day. While getting dressed and equipping the dagger in his belt, he added that this habit remained with him from the days of working as an assassin. As he ties his headdress, he notes that soon, however, there will be no need to constantly plan and adhere to discipline. Looking out the window, Cam says that if he manages to change the life of the second master, then career growth will not be long in coming. Holding a cup in his hands, Cam thinks that even though he lived as a murderer and an orphan for many years, now everything will be different. Suddenly, a man entered Cam's room and said that Mokun Pyong wanted to see him. Turning around, Master Cam threw a blank look at the newcomer. Clouds floated carefree across the sky. The fortress of the Brotherhood of Swords was immersed in peace. Suddenly, out of breath, Master Kam ran out of one of the buildings, leaving the doors open behind him. Blood flowed down Cam's face. 
He ran, gritting his teeth, mentally cursing what had happened. A moment before this, Master Kam learns from Moku Pyong that Cho Il-san has disappeared. Moku Pyong tells Kam that Cho was sent to make sure that Mok Yong un had lost his skills, but went missing. Moku Pyong, gritting his teeth in anger, asks Master Kam how dare he lie to him. Kam, afraid of Moku Pyong's reaction, thought that something was clearly wrong and replied that he would never dare to lie to him. Suddenly, Moki Pyong threw an object that came under his hand at Cam's head, ordering him to remain silent. He asked Cam why then Cho Il-san did not return, after which he asked whether Cam really took him for an idiot. Clenching his fists, Cam wondered how it turned out this way, thinking that at this rate, his new life would be much worse than the previous one. Mentally screaming that he won't let all his efforts go to waste, Cam asked Moku Pyong to give him some time to search for Cho. Moki Pyong intended to interrupt Kam, but he shouted that he swears on the warrior's life and puts his right hand on the line. Satisfied with Kam's proposal, Moki Pyong agrees, telling him to try to justify himself. Moki Pyong shouts out that he gives Kam two hours and that he will believe him if he finds Cho Il San, but if he does not succeed, he will lose not his hand, but his life. Master Kam bowed to Moki Pyong, saying that he would remember his words. Walking out of the gates of Moki Pyong's estate, Cam thought that it all started exactly from the moment the double appeared. Master Cam doubts that Cheon did anything, but decides that if he is involved, then Cam will definitely take revenge. Climbing the steps, Master Cam ran straight into a familiar face. Kokon, slightly in the clouds, was coming towards him, and Cam immediately headed towards him. Cam grabbed Kokon by the throat and pressed him against the wall, from the impact of which Kokon groaned. The embittered Cam told Kochan that he ordered him not to take his eyes off his double for a moment asking if he had forgotten about it. Kokan replied that he had not forgotten, after which Cam asked what he was doing then, reproaching him for working with a double. Shaking Coach Khan by the robe, Cam saw that something was hidden under it. Cam pulled out a mysterious book from under Kokan's robe, asking him what it was. Cam peered at the title of the book while Kokan shouted loudly so that Cam would not kill him. Master Cam froze and his eyelids opened wide, sweat running down his cheek. Cam realized that in his hand he was holding nothing more than a sacred scripture after reading the title Brotherhood of the Sword, The Path to Knowledge. Cam, filled with anger and anger, asked Kokon what he was doing here. The servants of the mansion watched in shock as Master Cam dragged Kokon across the floor, whispering along the way. Cam kicked down the door to Kaon's room, who at that time was holding something in his hands while standing in front of the mirror. Master Cam threw Go Chong inside the room, Cheon was distracted from reading and turned around. Seeing Go Chang lying unconscious, Cheon greeted Kam with welcome words. Master Kam, with a face full of dissatisfaction, demands that Cheon explain himself immediately. Cheon, thinking that his mood drops every time he sees Kam, asks him what exactly to explain to him. Cam closed the doors behind him, telling Cheon to stop fooling around, to which Cheon just grinned. Cam began to approach Cheon, saying that he warned him, while Cheon could not understand why he was so worried. Cam pounced on Cheon, grabbing him by the throat and pressing him against the wall, his fist ready to strike. Cam told Cheon that if he cheated, he would kill him. To which Cheon smilingly replied that their original agreement did not provide for this. Cam shouted at Cheon, asking what he did with Mokun Pyong's man, to which Cheon asked who he was talking about. Cam desperately shouts that Cheon should not dare to lie to him, to which Cheon says that Cam already knows about his powers and that he could not hurt him. Master Cam thinks intensely about what he knows and about Cheon's strength, and that he couldn't hurt Cho, but he feels some kind of unpleasant feeling. Cheon continued to gloat, telling Kam how could the third son, who had lost his skills, kill him. Realizing that this was still the work of Cheon, Kam, calling him a vile brat, raised his dagger to strike. Laughing madly, Cheon asked Kam what he will do now, since he has already replaced the master. Cheon continued that despite this, the damn double killed the second son's man. Cam, with eyes full of rage, stabbed Cheon with his dagger, spraying blood. Cheon sat against the wall, leaning his back against it, while Cam stood on his knees, sighing. Still sitting on his knees, Cam continued to talk, intending to tell Cheon his life story. Cam said that he was born an orphan and grew up as a killer, spent all his time and money to escape from there, after which he was an errand boy for the Brotherhood of the Sword for three years. Cam, in a frenzy, says that his life depended on these three years. But Cheon ruined everything, because it was not enough for him to kill Mok Yonggun. He also killed his beloved guard, Mokung Pyong. He continued by saying that he should kill Kion, because if he stays here, he will die. And if Cheon dies, he will be able to escape, and there is no other way out. Suddenly a thought strikes Cam, causing him to sharply shout no, confusing Cheon. 
Creeping closer to Cheon, Cam says that Cho Ilsan is dead in any case, and the dead cannot be returned, especially since he can be replaced. Putting his hand under his robe, Cam grabbed the book, saying that he didn't know where Cheon got it from. But Cam continued, asking Cheon that he also had the second part of the scripture. Cam orders Cheon to speak, thinking that by bringing the scripture he can hush up the matter with Joe Ilson. Cheon replies that he doesn't know, Cam answered, and said that Cheon apparently hasn't realized the situation yet. Bringing the dagger to Cheon's face, Cam said that if he angers him, Cam will rip out his Adam's apple and leave, but will change his mind if Cheon tells everything. Cam continued by saying that if Cheon behaves like a fool, he will cut him for a long time until he gives him the scripture, telling him to start telling before his patience runs out. Sighing, Cheon replied that so be it, he will tell Cam everything. Having let go of Cheon's head, Cam was happy, thinking that the fear of death still cannot be overcome no matter how well you pretend. Cam extended his hand to Cheon, telling him to give him the scripture. Cheon just silently took Cam's hand, which greatly surprised the latter. Not understanding, Cam asked Cheon what this meant, and he replied that he was giving him the holy scripture. Cheon immediately cleared up the misunderstanding by saying that the second part of the scripture was in his head. And while Cam was shocked by what he heard, Cheon added that there was something else. Grabbing Cam's hand, Cheon began the fusion ritual, draining the chi energy from Cam. Shocked, Cam suddenly realized that his energy was being sucked out of him. Cam swung the dagger with a scream, while Cheon laughed and said that he was not sure where and against whom it could be used. Laughing madly, Cheon told Cam that he himself had volunteered to be a pioneer, for which Cheon was grateful to him. Striking Cheon's hand with a dagger, Cam shouted at him to let him go. Cam continued to strike Cheon blow after blow, spewing blood in all directions. Unable to resist the pressure of Master Cam's blows, Cheon let go of his hand. After which Cam immediately pushed Cheon away with a kick to the stomach. Shuddering, Cam looked at Cheon kneeling against the wall. Looking at his hand, Cam realized that he did not feel the chi in his hand, wondering if Cheon had absorbed it. Cheon stood up and said that Cam was indeed a first-class master, as expected, but added that this was not enough for him. Cheon said that apparently there was no choice, and he would have to kill Cam in another way. Cam was outraged by Cheon's self-confidence, saying that after learning a couple of dirty tricks, he decided that he could defeat Cam. Cam again attacked Cheon, raising his dagger, shouting, Die! Cheon's eyes glowed red, and he called for help from the demon monk, who immediately knocked the dagger out of Cam's hand. Not understanding how Cheon blocked his blow with a frozen hand, Cam asked Cheon what kind of tricks these are. Cheon replied that this was just another trick that he would demonstrate clearly this time. Suddenly, Master Cam saw that his hand was being grasped by a demon monk. Rolling his eyes in surprise, Cam tries to break free, not understanding what the hell this is. Cheon replies that he will return everything to Master Kam, the Chi, and the dagger. After which, Kama plunges the dagger into his chest, causing the master to burst out screaming. Looking from the brow, Cheon added that both the dagger and Chi belonged to him. Cam walked away from Cheon, while the blood from his shoulder dripped onto the carpet. Gasping, Cam thought that the blow hit a critical point, which is bad because if you pull it out carelessly, blood will flow from the wound. Cam thought that he could not believe that Cheon would use a demon to take away his chi, thinking that he was foolish to rely on such a madman. However, Cam suddenly asked Cheon if he had forgotten about the poison, thinking that it was precisely for such an occasion that he fed it to Cheon. Cheon remained silent at first and asked Cam what he wanted to say. Cam, thinking that Cheon fell for his trick, says that he is offering a deal. Cam continued by saying that if they continue to fight, they will both lose in many ways. Kam says that he will give Cheon an antidote and a lot of money, thinking that he can give in for now because he will always have time to kill Cheon. Suddenly, Cam falls to his knees, coughing up a large amount of blood. Looking at his bloody hand, Cam thinks that something is wrong because the blood is circulating, but the body continues to weaken. Suddenly, Cam realizes that the cause of his profuse blood loss is poison. Approaching the window, Cheon says sarcastically, saying that even though his wound from the knife is small, it hurts him a lot. Cam asks how he managed to poison the dagger. Cheon replied that while Cam was picking at it with a knife, he dropped his blood there. Cam, not understanding, asked what he meant. Turning around, Cheon told Cam that his blood was incredibly poisonous, shocking Cam. Cheon listed poisonous plants, such as angelica and fennel, saying that as a child he ate a lot of such nasty things, which made his blood more dangerous than any poison. Leaning towards Kam, Cheon said that he, as Kam had already understood, did not need an antidote. In despair, Kam remained silent, but Cheon asked him why he was trembling, suggesting that he was frozen because of the open window. 
Keon continued by saying that because of the poison, Cam's temperature rises and that the lower temperature slows down the spread of the poison, which will make Cam live longer. Suddenly, Cam, with eyes full of fear, stretched his hands towards Keon, begging him to spare him. Pulling Cheon by the robe, Cam screamed pleadingly, begging Cheon to spare him. Cheon knelt down in front of Kam while he begged Cheon for mercy, saying that Kam was ready to become his faithful dog if Cheon would spare him. Taking Kam's hands, Cheon replies that he likes this attitude. Cheon replies that Kam is doing wonderfully and that with such an attitude they would work well together. Kam, with visible relief in his eyes, agreed with Cheon, a tear running down his face. But Cheon told him, that they would have worked together if their attitude had been like that from the very beginning. After which he takes the knife into Cam's chest up to the hilt, saying that Cam has betrayed more than once for the sake of his own goals, saying that loyalty is loyalty. Sitting on top of Cam, Cheon pressed on the dagger, saying that this is why Cam will die. Cam struggled in agony, wheezing and jerking his arms and legs as Cheon continued to press. After a couple of minutes of agony, Master Cam still gave his soul to Buddha. Cheon got up and began to stretch indignant that his shoulder hurt and that his clothes were ruined again, although he had just changed. Shaking off the book, Cheon says that he did it much faster than expected, saying that he was lucky and that he had to kill Cam because he knew the situation. Looking at Kochan, who is lying unconscious, Cheon thinks about whether to kill him too, but he immediately changes his mind based on the fact that Kam did not know about the burning of the scripture, which means Kokkan knows how to keep secrets and is also useful. Suddenly, Cheon tells Gochan to stop pretending, causing the latter to immediately jump up. When asked how Cheon understood, he said that Gochun's body kept changing position during the fight, adding that Gochun knows how to keep his mouth shut, saying that he likes it. Cheon told Gochan to tell the servants to disperse immediately while Cheon himself took care of Kam's body. Standing over Kam's body, Cheon thought about where he should start. Leaning over Kam's body, Cheon began to absorb the chi, Feeling that the heat was quickly disappearing, he wanted to check something. Kaon remembers that he felt something similar in the basement of the medical ward. He felt a cold and dark energy when he killed. Cold and gloomy energy replaced Chi and instantly enveloped Chion. Kion feels how this energy accumulates in him and does not dissipate, remembering how he felt like this when he was a ghost with a sickle, wondering if he needs to kill more to accumulate this energy. Cheong Yon silently watched Chion's actions while smoking her pipe. She suddenly turned to the demon monk, saying that she most likely understood how he was subdued, after which he tells the demon monk that Cheon is a real devil. Meanwhile, first rank master Zhang Yang Pyong reports to Mok Gun Pyong what Master Kam told him, believing that he did not lie to the master. While polishing the sword, Mok Yong Yun asked why do this because the truth will be revealed anyway. He continued saying that a person is a person and that if you prove yourself right away, you can rise high. Mok Yong Yun said, that it is the image of the master that should inspire respect and awe in order to show mercy at the right time. He continued by saying that the carrot and stick method should be used to achieve greater effect. Chan bowed, saying that the young master is insightful, to which Mo Kung Yun grinned, calling it idle talk. Chan replied that this was true, thinking that Kam was not distinguished by loyalty, which is why the test was necessary, thinking that the young master really understands people. The doors to Mok Gun Pyong's room opened, and someone shouted that they had a problem, to which Mok Gun Pyong asked what was the matter. Second rank master Hansen ran into the room and said that Cam was trying to kill his third son. Hearing such news, Cho and Mok Gun Pyong fell into a misunderstanding. Mok Gun Pyong says that Cam is ridiculous in trying to prove his innocence, but Han Seng says that this is not the main problem. Hansen says that the third son said that the criminal who incited Master Cam to kill was Mr. Mok Gun Pyong. In a fit of anger, Mok Gun Pyong stabbed his sword into the table, shouting the name Mok Yong Gun. Hansen asked Mr. Mok Gun Pyong not to touch Mok Yong Gun because this will only play into his hands. The gentleman does not want to sit idly by and let Mok Yong Gun mock him. Hansen invites the gentleman to go to a secret organization known for its cruelty. This organization is famous for its strict rules, especially in relation to the members of the organization themselves. They complete the task at any cost. Hansen wants to tell more about the mysterious mercenaries, a group of hereditary killers from Junwan. Although they are better known under the name Killers Who Bring Death, Pizalmun, Mo Gun Pyong too is filled with a mixture of horror and curiosity. Meanwhile, Mo Kyong Gun continues to repeat the breathing technique from the scripture. Unfortunately, the energy dissipates, preventing it from collecting enough energy. Mo Kyogun calls Gochen and asks him about the possible reasons for his failures. Kokan is surprised by Mo Kyogun's progress because until recently, 
He did not even know about martial arts, but is already able to feel the circulation of energy. Inside, Kokan is outraged at how quickly and easily everything comes to Makyogen, but he still wants to know more about why energy dissipates. Gochun asks Makyogen to concentrate and sit next to him. Without any training or techniques, Makyogen gained energy that flows through his entire body without any problems. But then Kokan felt something strange, cold and exciting. He was pushed away by a splash, after which the concentration of forces dissipated. Mokyogen asks if he's so hopeless and receives a disappointing answer. Kokan noticed next to the master's energy something with a nature unknown to him. Mokyogen wonders if he should give up martial arts. According to Go Chang, this mysterious cold energy is not like ordinary chi. Heat is life and cold is death. If so, the energy should be reversed. Kokan wants to stop the master from his dangerous undertaking but is interrupted by the spirit. The spirit binds Kokan and wants him to be silent. Since it cannot harm its owner, the only hope for liberation is for Mokyogen to destroy itself. At the same time in Hewadan, the Taoist master New Moon comes to the palace. Mrs. Sok is surprised that judging by the voice, they sent a young girl instead of the late master Myosin. In addition, the body of master Myosin himself was also brought. New Moon wants to find the killer using the body of Myosin's follower. The Taoist master wants to make sure of one more thing. The fact is that the third son will definitely be killed. Lady Siok admits that she is on the same side as the Taoist master. New Moon, as a sign of agreement, straightened her robe, beginning to recite the text of the prayer. To complete the ritual, she pierces the dead man's chest with a wooden stake. The dead man opens his eyes. A terrifying howl was heard. The energy of death filled the room. Mrs. Sok contemplated what was happening with horror in her eyes. Hundreds of hands begin to spread out from all the cavities of the late master's body, filling the entire room. Unexpectedly for the spirits, Hordes of hands instantly break into Mok Yogan's chambers. The demon monk stops the flow of hands right in front of the owner. But even his strength is not enough to hold back the flow of demonic hands. The reverse killing ritual reflects each blow on both Mok Yogan and the demons within him, or so Lady Seok thinks. The Taoist master continued to strike blow after blow. Mrs. Seok's face is filled with pleasure from the suffering caused to Mok Yogan. In one clear move, Cheong Yon cuts all the demonic hands in the room. She's angry that someone is trying to interfere with her plans. Only after repelling the master's blow does Cheong Yan strike back. The attack hits New Moon and she flies away along with Master Miyoshin's body. New Moon sees with horror how her entire veil is covered with her own blood. Taking a breath, the master only offers the lady to increase the price of her services. The servant is outraged by the new price, twice the previous one, but only for such a fee can the master risk his life. According to her, a supreme evil spirit lives in Mokyogen's chambers, and meeting him is extremely dangerous even for the master. If you leave everything as it is, the spirit will become Nanyon, after which the Taoist masters will no longer be able to harm it. The mistress is considering the deal, wanting to deal with Mokyogen as quickly as possible. Her servant's face is distorted in surprise. With absolute disgust and hatred, Lady Sayak agrees to the deal, but demands that the problem with Mokyogen be resolved. The new moon unties the veil telling us that demons like shamans are divided into levels. Throwing off her cape, she lists the levels, noting that Myosin, after five years of grueling training, never reached the first level. Adjusting her hat, New Moon reports that her level is third. Lady Sok is shocked by New Moon's face, surprised by her youth, which is not typical of Taoist masters. Finally, New Moon reports that in the ghostly palace, there are only three masters with personal spirits. As New Moon walks away, a huge shadow follows her along the wall. The master, in turn, promises that the third son will forget about peace forever. Meanwhile, Makyogen continues to concentrate energy. Cheong Yon is surprised that the energy of death and cold completely surrounds a living person. She doesn't understand the reason for what's happening, because Mokyogen was simply trying out all the techniques he could learn about. Cheong Yon looks at the awakened Makyogen with obvious interest in what is happening. With a slight grin, Mokyogen notes that with the help of reverse circulation of energy, he was able to achieve concentration without dissipation of forces. Cheong Yeon looks at Mokyogen in shock, asking if he's still alive. She doesn't understand at all how a living person attracts the breath of death. Finally, Mokyogen looks back and asks what happened. He approaches Kokhan, who is lying on the floor, not understanding why he has passed out. The demon monk quickly explains to the owner all the details of what happened. Cheong Yan begins to beat the demon monk for immediately telling the owner everything. Afterwards, she nevertheless confesses that she saved Mok Yogan's life from the reverse murder ritual. Suddenly, the room is filled with noise that distorts the space itself. Mok Yogan asks Cheong Yan what it is while she smokes silently. 
A horde of insects begins to fill the room, approaching Mok Yogan. Chong Yong is stunned that someone made a familiar out of the all-consuming spirit, namely the ghost from Yoya Mountain. Beetles, larvae, scolopendras, and spiders are visible in the shadows. Thousands of insects are walking towards Mok Yogan. Mok Yogan froze, looking at the horde of insects gradually entering the room. There is a creature called Aim living in the mountains and something living on the sea called Malian. They cause natural disasters called Lime Malian. And among the detailed evil spirits, there is a mountain spirit, an armadillo that summons insects. He's like a bird with a snake's tail and creates disasters with the help of heaps of insects. New Moon, leaving her chambers, says that she is not worried about the death of Master Myosin. Then he continues, saying that, however, looking at the disfigured face of a familiar person is not a pleasant sight. The New Moon makes a seal, wanting to feed the third son to her spirit. The mountain spirit quickly heads to Mokyogen's chambers. With one powerful slap, Mokyogen brings Kochen to his senses. Insects have already filled almost the entire room. Mokyogen is trying to contain their influx. Just touching the insects, Kokan's hand became covered in blisters. Cheong Yan mocks Mokyogen's efforts and says that they are about to be eaten alive. Mokyogen reminds Cheong Yan about the contract, asking how long she plans to sit idle. Cheong Yan, in response, offers to help in exchange for his soul, which is why Mokyongun decides that it is better to die. Cheong Yan offers instead a bet that if he finds himself near death, he will give his soul to the spirit. However, if he can handle it on his own, Cheong Yan will begin to protect him with full force. Mok Yogan decisively crushed the beetle, saying that he was determined to win against Cheon Yon. The third son wants to set the lamp on fire to scare away the bugs. Mok Yogan performs a fusion ritual, concentrating dark energy. The lamp flies straight into Mok Yogan's hands. Mok Yogan gradually realizes that Mrs. Seok is behind the attack. Kok Khan, for better effect, suggests setting the blanket on fire. Mok Yogan's thoughts are focused on killing the Taoist who serves Lady Seok at any cost. After New Moon's command, the beetles suddenly begin to squirm in the air. It turns out that the Taoist master's right eye is white because he sees the hidden world, world of Qi. With the help of such vision, she has no problem attacking through the wall, seeing everything in full view. The armadillo spirit breaks through doors and walls in the path of its owner. New Moon meets Makyogen's gaze. In it, she sees two flows of Qi, indicating the presence of a spirit in its submission. A thousand hands pin the demon monk to the floor. The hidden dagger for throwing Kokan is immediately revealed by the vision of Qi. The Taoist master uses a talisman that shoots lightning directly at Go Chung. He orders the spirit armadillo to deliver the finishing blow to Mok Yogan. Mok Yogan with Kochan's dagger runs towards the master, but a blow from thousands of beetles pins him to the wall. It seems that the battle is already over. Even the remains of the third son are not visible behind the beetles. Kokan is unconscious, the demon monk is immobilized, and Mokyogun is invisible behind a swarm of beetles. The master praises his familiar for a job well done. New Moon was about to leave. She expected the task to be more difficult. But suddenly Mokyogun rises from the shadows, clothed in a dark aura. With a dagger, he strikes blow after blow into his own flesh. From his blood, the beetles instantly fall to the ground. Mokyogun, with madness in his eyes, drenches himself in his own blood. With his hand raised above his head, blood flows onto Mokyogun's head. He points the dagger at the enemy because his blood is pure poison. New Moon still jumped back at the last second. The familiar armadillo instantly comes to the defense of the mistress. Meanwhile, the master completes a spell that enhances the strength of the spirit. But Mokyogun intercepts the armadillo with the help of a fusion ritual. The familiar is defeated, the beetles now pose no danger. The pain that is caused to the armadillo also affects the New Moon. Suddenly, she realizes that Mokyogun is absorbing her familiar's powers. Since the armadillo has negative energy, it is an ideal source of strength for Mokyogun. Mokyogun is delighted with the amount of negative energy received from one spirit. It replaces hundreds of murders of people. New Moon in tears asks to spare her henchmen. Meanwhile, Mrs. Seok is still waiting for the result of the battle. She wants to verify Mokyogun's death for herself. In addition to killing his third son, Sok expects to receive the Holy Scripture so that it does not fall into the wrong hands. The lady sees a silhouette approaching her, reminiscent of the new moon. The lady is already anticipating good news about Mok Yogan's death. Her son will become the head of the clan. She has dreamed about this for so long. She had already seen her subordinates congratulate her on her success. The Taoist master abruptly stops in place. The lady and servants look blankly at the Taoist master. Juice asks the master to tell him about what happened and the result of the battle. The new moon reports that the ghostly palace is faithful to its mistress, but cannot eliminate the third son. With this news, Miss Seok was speechless. In fear of losing the armadillo, New Moon conspires with Mok Yogan. 
She undertook to blame Lady Sock for everything that happened, which would lead to a conflict between the monks and her court. Overcoming her pride, New Moon reports that the third son was not possessed, and she cannot kill him. She asks Mrs. Siok to never contact the ghost palace again. The night is interrupted by the roar of the crowd. Everyone goes towards the lady. The guards approach. They are already aware of the murder of the third son ordered by the lady. Sayok can't think of anything other than his hatred for Mokyogan. The third son asks New Moon about what happened. She only draws his attention to the illuminated streets and the roar of the crowd outside the walls. New Moon realizes that by betraying the principles of the ghostly palace, a terrifying fate awaits her. Before leaving, she asks for the familiar to be returned, as agreed. But Mokyogan still had a few questions for her. He wants to know more about the owners of spirits such as the demon monk or the armadillo. With Chi's vision, New Moon sees that the third son is subjugating two spirits at once, but notices that there is another one inside him. Mokyogan strangles the armadillo because he wants to get an answer as soon as possible. She reports that mountain spirits are divided into six stages. The spirit of Hyunsu, who is also a ferocious beast. The spirit of Kwesu, called a monster, Yosu, a werewolf spirit. The spirit Masu is a beast, Yongsu is a spiritual beast, Shinsu is a mythical animal. Including the new moon, there are only three spirit masters in the ghost palace. She spoke about Master Go, who remained in the shadows for a long time, with the spirit of chaos and destruction. There is also the shadow palace, little is known about him, but he occupies the highest position. Mokagan suggests that the spirit of Master Go is Yongsu, or even Sinsu. The new moon does not confirm his guesses, saying that such creatures were found only in legends. She gives her third son a book with information about spirits called the Book of Mountains and Seas. Makyogen wants to get the best Lamellion. The armadillo is returned to its owner, for which New Moon reluctantly thanks the third son. With an exhausted familiar in her arms, New Moon leaves Makyogen's chambers. Now, Mrs. Sayok will not be able to keep a close eye on Makyogen, and the absorbed energy of the armadillo should be enough to create an energy core, and therefore to master the martial art. Koken is still worried about the leaving guest he sees in her a hidden grudge against Makyogen. Makyogen himself only tells him with a grin to continue to watch, because he is sure that New Moon will keep his word. Looking at the suffering familiar, she believes that he's about to die. New Moon sincerely wishes Mokyogen a death full of suffering. A terrible sudden pain covers her, her eye bleeds, she feels a ritual of reverse murder. In the light of the blood-red moon, Cheongyeon looms over the New Moon. With horror in her eyes, New Moon chokes on her own blood. Meanwhile, Mrs. Seok accuses Makyogen of slander in court. The judge interrupts her and asks the lady to remain quiet. When asked about the disturbances in the chambers, Sok speaks of the need to prohibit visits to the chambers of the head of the clan. The judge notices that the young master saved the head, and he asks again if she tried to kill him. Mrs. Sok, in a panic attack, screams to the chief judge. The judge promises to investigate the case impartially. The judge is going to question everyone, Lady Second Son and Third Son. In private, he ponders the reasons why his first wife and second son want the third to die. This is a power struggle that the youngest son, under the tutelage of the head, is unaware of. And the third, after losing his family and skills, has no chance of winning. The judge noticed strange behavior in the third son. Perhaps there is something he doesn't know about that is bothering him. Mokyogen, in the company of Cochin and the demon monk, continues to concentrate energy. Cheongyeon leaks through the wall, which attracts the attention of the demon monk. Cheongyeon is surprised at how quickly Makyogun was able to begin concentrating the energy absorbed from the armadillo. The idea of creating an energy core with the breath of death now seems quite real to her. Cheongyeon notices that Makyogun has a very pretty appearance. Makyogun locks eyes with Cheongyeon, asking what she's doing. With a blush on her face, Cheongyeon turns around and says that it's none of his business. Makyogun responds with a smirk and the question, seriously? With a red face, Cheong Yong tells Mokyogun to stop doing nonsense and focus on Chi. She now regrets that she made a bet with him, saying that the Taoists did not try hard in their duel with Mokyongun. And then Mokyogun remembers that he wanted to check something, namely the same energy core that required so much energy. Cheong Yong, smoking a pipe, thinks that it is impossible to create a core in such a short time. Immediately, Mokyogun demonstrates the energy core to his spirits which causes Chong Yon's sincere surprise because it is almost impossible to cope with such things. She wants to personally check the state of the core and Qi energy. Chong Yon puts his hand to try to reach the core in the host's body. However, Makyogen's body does not allow her hand, which makes her clearly upset. Chong Yon suggests that the demon monk try to do the same. The result remained the same. They failed again. 
for an unclear reason. Chong Yan's guess is that this happened because they are related to Mak Yogan. She turns to Gokhan, who is snoring next to them. Sharply, Chong Yan penetrates his chi, after which Go Chang screams heartrendingly. After the spirit's unexpected manipulation, he passes out, but Chong Yan notices that he was only pretending to be asleep. The result proves that the problem is not with Chong Yan's abilities, but no way to test Mok Yogong's chi was found. Suddenly, there is a knock on the door. The voice of the Supreme Judge is heard. He introduces himself and asks if the third son is sleeping. Mok Yogan does not understand why the Supreme Judge came so late. Chief Judge Sun Unbayek, the most faithful servant in the Brotherhood of the Sword, is trusted by the elders because he has repeatedly proven the inviolability of his principles. Because of him, even the restless Mrs. Sayok must control herself. At the moment, he is the most powerful person in the clan. The judge enters the room. Mok Yogan asks what's the matter. Sang Unbek bows, apologizing for the danger the third son was exposed to. Mok Yogan says that nothing bad happened, and he doesn't have to worry. It is clear that for the judge this is not a trifle but a serious offense. But still Mok Yogan convinces him that everything is fine with him. Here the judge raises his hand over the third and says that he did not come in for long. Mok Yogan doesn't understand what the hand above his head has to do with it. The judge begins to pat him on the shoulder, convincing him that his words made him feel better. But he's interested in where the dagger that the judge gave to all candidates for self-defense went to. He is worried whether the third one has lost it. Turning around, Mok Yogan looks at Kochan lying unconscious. Mok Yogan says he put the dagger in a drawer in the closet, which pleases the judge. He says that it would be sad if the dagger was lost. The light tone of the conversation is disrupted by Mok Yogan's phrase. He has not heard of anyone receiving a dagger. The judge only confirms that indeed nothing happened in the first place. Afterwards, the judge delivers a sharp blow towards Mok Yogan, who was expecting such a move. The bed is destroyed, but Mok Yogan managed to jump away and avoid damage. The judge says that he made two mistakes. He hits the vital points, immobilizing the third, and says that the first mistake was that the third son was always proud when someone bowed to him. And secondly, after the fourth son got rid of the third, if someone raised a hand against him, he cowered. But Mok Yogan was too noble and too calm today. The judge has sealed all the meridians. Now the third cannot move. Soon Unbek is waiting for an answer. He asks where the real third son is. But then, with a smile, Mok Yogan gets to his feet, which stuns the judge. He cannot understand how he can move at all with blocked meridians. With a terrifying look on his face, Mok Yogan calls out to the dark spirit Cheong Yon. Suddenly something otherworldly penetrates the judge's chest. He feels his heart being squeezed by someone's hand. She asks him why he acts so thoughtlessly because he wants to die. Mok Yogun praises the strength of Cheong Yon, who still holds the judge's heart in her hand. Cheong Yon realized that she could not penetrate Mok Yogun because their energies, life and death, were opposites. She sees how Mok Yogun actually formed an energy core. Cheong Yon asks Mok Yogun what he will do now that he has been found out. Mok Yogun replies that even if he was discovered, he cannot kill the judge. Mok Yogun finally found a solution. He orders the demon monk to take possession of San Ubik. The judge is afraid he does not understand who Mok Yogan is talking to. San Wubek feels an unexpected sharp shock. He cannot breathe. He cannot understand anything. There is a third son in front of him, but he is completely immune to acupuncture. In addition, someone is holding his heart in his hands. The judge realizes that he has learned something that he should never have known. He asks the demon who he is. With an arrogant smile, Mok Yogan only notes that the judge is only the third master of the Brotherhood of the Sword. The sun shone above the fortress of the Brotherhood of the Sword, illuminating the rooftops with sunlight. Koken walked along the corridor, thinking that when he woke up, the bed was broken and the guards had become too polite. He thinks that until yesterday, it was the guards who were watching them, when suddenly the man in front of him says that the gentleman is waiting for him. Not understanding what was happening, Koken bowed back, awkwardly muttering gratitude. Entering the room, Kokan is so shocked by what he sees that sweat immediately pours down his face. Gochang saw the Chief Justice standing next to Mok Yonggun, after which the latter invited him to enter. Mok Yonggun told Wubek that his apology was accepted, after which the latter immediately took his leave. Bowing slightly, Wubek walked past Kokan, frozen in one pose. The blushing Gochan did not utter a word, but Mok Yonggun said that he was on time and offered to eat together. Unable to hold on any longer, Gochang shouted out, asking Mok Yonggun to explain everything, to which the third son replied that he would tell him later. Mok Yonggun tells Gochan that he has a question for him. Mok Yonggun asked if he could learn about the basics of the Brotherhood's martial arts. Discouraged by the question, Gochang dropped the food he had picked up with his chopsticks and then asked what Mok Yonggun meant. Shortly before the conversation with Gochang, Mok Yonggun, 
in the company of Cheongyon, was repeating the movements from the Brotherhood scripture, not understanding why they did not match. Exhaling smoke from his pipe, Cheongyon replied that the reason was because it was an advanced level. She said that the techniques in the scriptures are high level, which means the reader must have an appropriate level of understanding. When asked by Mok Yung gun whether it is better to have advanced techniques, Chong Yun says that he is a fool, answering that developing skills without understanding the basics is impossible. Chong Yun told Mok Yung gun that the enlightenment required to reach a high level is called ascension, and it allows you to go beyond the possible. She continued by saying that ascension is achieved by eliminating unnecessary poses and learning skills that will not make sense without understanding the basics. Recalling Chong Yun's words, Mok Yung gun said that without understanding the basics of martial arts, he would not understand the basics of fencing. Go Chang jumped up from the table, asking Mok Yung gun that if he was going to learn the Brotherhood's secret fencing technique, then he was going to become the next head, which Mok Yung gun immediately denies. Kokan asked why he needed this then. Mok Yung gun said that it would be useful, to which Kokan replied that this is a masterpiece of art known throughout Murim. Go Chang said that if Mok Yung gun still manages to learn, then problems will arise in the future. Mok Yung gun said that only if he is caught. Crossing his arms, Kokun said that he could not teach him the basics of martial arts. He said that the reason is that he himself does not know them, because the basis of martial arts in the Brotherhood of the Sword is unique to everyone. Kokun said that the base, which includes the ten techniques and the mock sword art, was inherited by the head of the clan. Therefore, only those with mock blood in their veins could learn this. Following from this, only the head of the clan or other candidates could train Mok Yongun. Kokun thought that the situation was bad because not only did the other son see him as an enemy, but he was also not the real Mok. Rising from the table, Kotkan replied that nothing could be done. Without dropping any details, Mok yong -gun left the room, saying that he had left, to which Kokan only asked where. Mok yong -gun said that he would go to someone who would teach him the basics. Go Chung whispered that he didn't need to do this because they might make him suspicious, to which Mok yong -gun replied that nothing would change from this. Mok yong -gun and Go Chan came to the training place of their youngest son. Mok Yung gun intended to greet the younger one when suddenly Goshan stopped him. Kokan said that he told him about the case when he called the mother of the fourth, the real Mok Yung gun for which he was beaten. Kokan recalled that day, saying that the third had broken legs and a couple of ribs, and how he screamed in tears for help. Go Chang said that the main problem is not so much the hatred of the fourth for the third, but that Mok Yu Chun at 16 is already at the peak of its development. Suddenly, Cheong Yong appears and tells Mok Yong Gun that the younger one is really not bad. She says that there are few people with such an aura at the age of 16, saying that such people are called geniuses, and that if she were alive, she would take him as a student. Cheong Yong tells Mok Yong Gun to be careful because the sun is up and she won't be able to help. Go Chang continued to talk about how they should find someone else while Mok Yong Gun was already approaching Mok Yu Chun. Noticing Mok Yong Gun approaching, Mok Yu Chun immediately grimaced in anger and disgust. Mok Yung gun just said hi while Go Chang whimpered shakingly behind him. Surprised that the third son was not afraid, Mok Yu Chun was going to threaten to beat him. Suddenly his tone immediately changed as soon as he saw what Mok Yong gun was holding in his hands. Mok Yong gun held the basics of fencing of the Brotherhood of the Sword in his hand, inviting Mok Yu Chun to take it for himself. Mok Yu Chun asked where the evidence was that the book was real, to which Mok Yung gun threw it to the younger one, telling him to take a look for himself. Intensely leafing through the book, Mok Yuchin realized that the third son had not lied, and the book spoke of an advanced level of skills. Suddenly, Mok Yung Gun notices that the book is missing pages, asking Mok Yung Gun where they are. Mok Yung Gun just silently points his finger at his head, smiling sarcastically. An irritated Mok Yuchin asked him where he got the scripture. Mok Yung Gun said that it doesn't matter, because the only thing that matters is that he now has the scripture. Breaking into a cry, Mok Yuchin asked why the third son came here. Mok Yong Gun just smiled, listening to Mok Yu Chun, who thought that the third son had come to mock him. Throwing the book at Mok Yong Gun, Mok Yu Chun told him to get out of here. Picking up the scripture and dusting it off, Mok Yong Gun said that he came to make a deal because the post of head of the clan does not bother him. Mok Yu Chun asks if Mok Yong Gun is really not interested in the position of head. Then, without waiting for an answer, he attacked him, hitting him in the face with his fist. Mok Yong Gun flew a couple of meters away from the blow of the fourth son to the screams of Ko Chan. Mok Yung gun says that he will not believe this nonsense, saying that the memories of the beating two years ago have already faded in Mok Yung gun's mind. Mok Yu Chin shouted that Mok Yung gun didn't even think about approaching him again. 
Wiping away the blood flowing from his nose, Mokyonggun is delighted, thinking that the fourth son is on a completely different level. He thinks that he still cannot compare with his grandfather's killer. Mokyonggun thinks that after seeing other experts like Master Kam and Sanun Baek, he understood why Gochang was fussing. After all, looking at Mokyuchan and the aura that he exuded, Mokyonggun realized that he was a real monster. Mokyonggun realized that this time, luck couldn't solve everything, because he didn't even have time to react, which made him wonder whether it was really possible to become so strong thanks to the arts. Thinking that if everything worked out, he would avenge his grandfather, Mokyonggun grinned, saying that Mokyuchan had a heavy hand. Approaching Mokyonggun, he said that apparently Mokyonggun did not have enough and should be added, to which the latter replied that he knew that Mokyuchan would not believe him. Raising his hand for another blow, Mokyuchan replied that he would not believe a single word Mokyonggun said. Hearing Mokyuchan's words, Mokyonggun replied that nothing could be done, and that he would have to give the scripture to Lady Siok or the second brother. From these, Mokyuchan immediately froze and his expression changed from anger to fear. Taking Mokyuchan's hand, he asked him how about Mokyonho or Mokongpyong becoming the head of the clan, saying that they were unlikely to leave him alone. Crossing glances, Mokyonggun said that Mokyuchan was the receiver whom the head trusted the most. Mokyuchan screamed angrily, asking if he was thinking of threatening him. With a chilling look, Mokyonggun said that he was only presenting him with a fate accompli, asking if he thought that he was really trying to intimidate him. Surprised by Mokyonggun's words, Mokyuchan froze for a moment, realizing what was happening. Letting go of Mokyonggun's robes, Mokyuchan asked him who he was. Looking at him, Mokyuchan asked him the question, have you been replaced? Hearing Mokyuchan's words, Go Chang immediately clenched his teeth in fear and panic. Mokyonggun continued to silently look at Mokyuchan with a mixture of equanimity and indifference on his face. Changing his facial expression to a slightly irritated one, Mokyonggun asked, so what? Amazed by what he heard in response to his question, Mok Yu-chun was perplexed. Mok Yung-gun said that he spoke as if he knew everything about him, to which Mok Yu-chun laughed, saying that he did. Mok Yu-chun grinningly said that two years ago, one guy was beaten like a dog, and as soon as he appeared, he ran away in fear, asking if he was this guy. To Mok Yu-chun's surprise, Mok Yung-gun immediately agreed with his words, but continued. He asked what else Mok Yu-chun knew about him, besides their relationship and the incident two years ago. Does he know about his tastes, beliefs, train of thought or position, or what feelings prompted him to refuse the post of head, asking if he will answer at least one question? Suddenly, Mok Yuchin burst into flames, shouting back the question of what Mok Yungan knew about him, saying that he ignored him and stayed away, considering him a non-entity. Mok Yungan said that it was his turn to ask, asking why he, because no one except his father, recognized him, asking why Mok Yungan did not choose a more worthy one. Mokyonggun told him that the reason was simple, saying that he was the best. Mokyonggun's answer shocked Mokyuchan so much that he was only perplexed. He remembered how he grew up being persecuted because he was born out of wedlock. He was completely alone, which is why he began to train tirelessly. Mokyuchan trained so that someone would recognize him. And now this someone is standing in front of him, the one from whom he least expected to hear a confession. Mokyuchan felt that Mokyonggun hated him for that incident two years ago, bringing his gaze to the sky. He wondered if this meant that he too had to change. Sighing, Mok Yuchion, to Go Chang's surprise, showed agreement regarding Mok Yunggun. He replied that he would listen to Mok Yunggun, no matter what the deal was. Mok Yunggun smiled in his usual manner, announcing his business proposal. Mok Yunggun and Go Chun leave the place where the younger one was training. Mok Yunggun hummed a melody. Go Chang was silent. Looking after Mok Yunggun, Ko Chun thought that he could only recognize the skill of his double. Kokan wondered how he would get the foundation of the family martial art, but he had no idea that everything would work out like this, thinking that no one would be able to play so naturally. Mokyonggun told Mokyuchin that he had three requests for him. His first request was not to touch him, even if he became the head of the clan. The second request was financial support. Mokyuchin agreed to Mokyonggun's requests, saying that as long as he did not touch him, he would not touch him in return, asking about the third request. Mok Yunggun's third request was to teach him the basics of family art. Hearing Mok Yunggun's words, Mok Yuchan did not suspect anything, and only laughed, asking Mok Yunggun if he had forgotten them. After which he agreed, saying that he would help Mok Yunggun remember the basics, which was his original plan. Because Mok Yunggun satisfied Mok Yuchan's desire to be recognized, he taught him the basics without a doubt. Even a genius like Mok Yuchan needed a couple of hours to memorize the secret techniques, but Qian only needed to hear them once. Glad that everything went smoothly, 
Go Chang told Mok Yong-gun that he had done a good job. Go Chang said that he was very impressed but regretted that Mok Yong-gun had to talk about the scripture, which Mok Yong-gun did not share. Mok Yong-gun told Go Chang that he told his youngest son exactly the wrong thing. Mok Yong-gun said that he thought it was worth keeping it a secret by telling Go Chang the secret. Mok Yong-gun said that he changed the scripture slightly, changing every 13 or 14 characters. He was worried that he might get caught, but everything went smoothly. Go Chun understood why he was telling everything so simply, Mok Yong-gun continued, saying that if someone makes a mistake in the exercise, they will go crazy. After which, smiling as indifferently as always, he asked what's wrong. To which Coach Khan could only hopelessly answer that in general, nothing. Meanwhile, in the Shadow Palace, a Taoist master named Guo sat. The shadow of the ghostly palace addressed him, saying that they had lost contact with the new moon. Shadow revealed that she not only failed to put Myosin to rest, but also accused and betrayed Lady Sayok, which was the end of their relationship with the Brotherhood of Swords. Shadow called upon Go, his favorite student, to find New Moon, find out the truth, and restore their reputation. Guo replied, I obey, after which the spirit in the form of a huge bird appeared behind him. A thick fog descended on the mountains, enveloping the surrounding forests. On the ground near the old roots of a tree lies the hat of a Taoist master stained with blood. A steel ring tied with an orange ribbon lay on the ground next to a pool of blood. Taoist Master Guo stood near a huge pool of blood, next to which scraps of cloth were scattered. Go brought the talisman, holding it with two fingers, and it immediately decayed. Go realizes that this is the place where New Moon was brutally killed, despite the fact that she was one of the three great masters of the Phantom Palace. Realizing that there was something more to it, Guo said a prayer to shed light on the events that happened with the New Moon. Continuing to read the prayer, Go perceived in the air, and the energy of death began to flow towards him from the area around him. Go's wide eyes lit up with a radiance, and he was able to see the full picture of what had happened. He sees how New Moon met Miss Sayok and performed a ritual with Musin's body. Then he saw how someone repelled the New Moon spell, and then her battle with Mokyongun. He saw how New Moon lost the battle with Mokyongun, how her spirit was captured by him. And then he saw the last minutes of the New Moon, hearing her words about the thirst for revenge. Returning from the vision, Go feels that something foreign is looming menacingly over his shoulders. He is overcome with horror. He will feel the fear that New Moon experienced before her death. Unable to bear the horror hanging over him, Go turned around with eyes full of fear. But when he turns around, he sees only the New Moon hat, which was lying leaning on a tree. Sweat drips from his forehead as he realizes that the incredibly strong Supreme Spirit Cheong Yon was here. Raising his head to the sky, Go somehow realizes that he needs more time to prepare, mentioning a certain Gojo. Meanwhile, a peaceful cloudless sky froze above the castle. The sun was shining on the valley from behind the mountains. Chong Yon was tense and silently smoked her pipe while watching Mok Yogan. Mok Yongun followed the scripture exactly, repeating every martial arts move one after another. At one point, he raised his leg, repeating the stance from the scripture. He then repeated the straight punch shown in the book. Then he finished the combination with a direct blow, pulling his second hand to shoulder level. Observing Mok Yong-gun's actions, Cheong Yon tried to understand what he was trying to achieve with such methods. After all, usually beginners must repeat standard positions over and over again in order to develop basic techniques. However, even now, with the exception of the first position of the technique, Mok Yong-gun simply has no mistakes in any stance. He only needs to repeat training to strengthen his muscles because the accuracy of his movements is already at a high level. Cheong Yon, with a clear look of surprise on his face, realizes that Mok Yogan is an absolute genius of martial arts. She is slightly annoyed because she expected Mok Yogan to ask her for advice. And although she was not going to tell him anything, now she is ready to help him if he asks nicely. Cheong Yon became enraged by her own thoughts about Mok Yogan so loudly and emotionally that he himself noticed it. Goshen comes to Mok Yogan, informing him of his arrival. Mok Yogan only says that he wants him to do something, which surprises Gokhan. The events move to Chongnan County, a place filled with crowds of people on the street and a high wall of the city. Gokhan is sitting in the lily of the valley pavilion, holding in his hands a small piece of paper with some content that Mok Yogan gave him. With a somewhat incomprehensible and thoughtful face, Gokhan read what was written on the piece of paper. Gokhan, looking at the piece of paper received from Mok Yongan, wondered what kind of hieroglyph was depicted on it. When asked by Kochan about the nature of this sign, Mok Yong-gun only asked to deliver a piece of paper with the hieroglyph to the information guild. But Kochan is skeptical, because he believes that the only problem is that no one in the area is even doing this. 
Kokan suddenly catches himself thinking that he doesn't understand why he's worried, because now he's just an errand boy. Kokan looked at the ceiling and thought, and during the course of his internal monologue, he came to the conclusion that he had no purpose in life. In the distant past, Kokan was abandoned by his parents, which led him to the path of an assassin. And even with this work, he had to leave, after which he met Master Kam, a terrible man who only used Kokan as a tool. There is nothing to complain about with Malkyogan, especially with his own low-level skills, says Kokan. Kokan realizes that he can only go with the flow until he becomes completely useless and is abandoned again. On the other hand, Goken is now less burdened with hard work. However, he constantly worries about what such an impulsive Mokyogen might get himself into. Under Kokan's words that he was simply doing what he was told, someone approached him going down the steps. A large man enters the room with a roar of laughter. Next to him is a young girl in expensive clothes. A man, seemingly tipsy, asks for forgiveness for the long wait. This is the informant of the Lily of the Valley Pavilion, or rather its owner, Guac. Kocha is infuriated that his interlocutor looks drunk already in the morning, but he simply gives him a request. Guac wraps his arm around the girl next to her, her look as sophisticated as it is miserable. The owner of the pavilion asks what Kokan thinks about the girl, whether she is beautiful. He kicks the girl out of the room, to which Guac replies that there is nothing to worry about. Kochkan's face turns gloomy, and in a terrifying manner he repeats the request to drive the girl out. Guac lets go of the girl and tells her to leave. His drunken grin still hasn't subsided, while the girl bows to Gochan. He tells the girl to wait for him, and raises her hand for a lewd spank. Gochan stops Guac's heinous act by slamming his fist on the table. However, even without Gochan's help, the girl herself gives Guac a strong slap in the face. Kochan, slightly taken aback by the current situation, froze with his fist on the table watching what was happening. She talks about how tired she is from all this, raising her hands to her hair, while Guac embarrassedly held his hand to his cheek. The girl lets her hair down. Guac recognizes the girl as the one and then attacks her from behind. Suddenly, the girl dodges and jumps over Guac using his own head as a support, which shocks him. Standing with one hand on Guac's head, the girl twists his neck in one movement. Guac's body falls as the mysterious girl jumps away from him. Kokan immediately grabbed his sword, not understanding what the hell was happening. However, he does not have time to draw his blade, because the girl has already kicked the table in his direction. Kokan's face was distorted with fear and anticipation of being hit in the face with a table. The girl, grinning from behind the table flying towards Kokan, says that they have not seen each other for a long time. She calls him the 86th low-ranking assassin and stabs needles into his body. Frozen from the technique performed on him, Kokan watched as the girl began to tear off her clothes. Finally, the girl takes off her covering clothes, saying that she's disappointed that the 86th was not able to recognize her. After which, biting the tip of her flying knife, she calls him Mr. Kokan. He is that in front of him, Hacharin is the first and only granddaughter of the head of one of the four clans of killers, namely the Flying Killers. In surprise, he only muttered, Madam, to become the head of a clan, you need to kill a hundred people. This is a tradition. The one who passes this test will become the head of the Flying Killer Clan and one of the four great killers of the center. In addition, he will receive one secret poison weapon for his personal use. Charon pulls out the benevolence needles, her personal weapon, from Gochong and releases the blood poisoned by them. Kokan understands that since such a legendary weapon belongs to her, she is already the head of the clan. And although she was the only worthy heir, Kokan considers her character a huge minus for the status of the head. He remembers how in childhood, she was already unbearable and did not know any boundaries of what was permitted. Gokan stares at Charon, realizing how much she has changed in appearance since then. The girl took the last needle out of Kokan's body, not painlessly. She says she didn't expect to see Kokan in such a place. He continues to address her as mistress, but she interrupts him because she is now the leader of the clan. With a satisfied smile, she boasts that she is now the head. Kokan confirms his guess. Charon asks him if he plans to treat the clan leader appropriately. Kokan kneels down and already addresses her as the leader of the clan. Charon came here to get to her first son because she heard that he is extremely depraved. Now she will go with Kokhan. She received information that the 29th mid-rank assassin, Master Kam, had failed a mission in the palace. Kokhan is overtaken by memories of the master and how he was killed. Charon is surprised that he couldn't cope with his skills and realizes that he's most likely already been killed. At the end, Charon adds that she is here, first of all, to deprive Makyogen of his head and complete the mission. The sun is already setting over the palace. Scarlet color covers the entire sky. Chongyon still silently watches Makyong-gun repeat the exercises. 
Cheong Yan, with obvious dissatisfaction, asks Mok Yogun when his training will stop. Mok Yogun looks at the sky and finally remembers how much time has passed since the morning. Mok Yong Gun suggests that Cheong Yong should have dinner, since this is the time. Cheong Yon blushes at Mok Yong Gun's proposal, only smiling silently in response. While Mok Yogun is reading a book on techniques for summoning spirits, the girl behind him unashamedly eats everything on the table. He asks if she likes the food, to which, continuing to chew, she nods positively. The girl says that one of the greatest joys in life is food. Cheong Yon possessed this girl only to experience the pleasure of the meal. She took possession of the maid a few days ago and really liked it, but Cheong Yong is indignant that the body cannot withstand even a quarter of an hour. However, when Cheong Yong tried to take possession of a prettier maid, she almost killed her, because an ordinary body is not able to withstand such a level of force, after which Cheong Yong throws the body of the maid. Cheong Yong tells Mok Yogan that he's too interested in Taoism. He only says that he is sincerely interested in reading the Book of the New Moon, namely the technique of summoning six spirits. Mok Yongun suddenly thought about what if he managed to summon the spirit of a dead man. Suddenly, Mok Yogan turns around and Cheong Yon also notices something. She notices that he has become more attentive and sensitive. They both look towards their brothers in law. A dark aura fills the room. Meanwhile, Go Chang provides Cheren with maid clothes. She calls her a rag and says that courtesans have even better outfits. Go Chen is at his limit. He is incredibly infuriated by Cheren's character, but something else worries him. If she finds out that Go Chang betrayed Master Kam, he is finished. He needs to quickly tell Chong Yon about her. He wants to go out while Cheren is changing clothes and getting ready to go out. Cheren mockingly asks if he wants to watch. After all, when else will he get such a unique chance? Go Chen blushed and fell silent, and Cheren burst out laughing, saying that it was just a joke. After Cheren thanks Go Chen for his help, he answers politely. Kokan says that he himself was looking for an opportunity to avenge Master Kam. He understands that otherwise, he will not survive. Cheren is happy to hear this because even after all these years, they are a team. Here she stops and says that she trusts Kokan. Suddenly, the tone of the conversation changes. She asks if this is what he wanted to hear. She says that if Master Cam died and Kokan did nothing, then he is on the same page with the murderer. Cheren calls Go Chang a pathetic scum who is incapable of even taking revenge. Kokan is already thinking that Cheren has found out about everything and he is destined for death. The girl's tone becomes light again. She remembers that Kokan has not changed at all since his early years, still stupid and boring. She believes that such scum should be killed immediately. Kokan asks himself when everything went wrong, when the double killed the real candidate, when he betrayed Master Kam. He realizes that the cause of everything was his own weakness. Cheren offers a different ending. Gokan must kill Makyogan, avenging Master Kam and then commit suicide. She raises her dagger as she bids farewell to Gokan. This could be his last memory. A hand covered in chi energy bursts out from behind the wall. Fusion Rite knocks out Charon's dagger and pulls it to her hand. Charon looks in surprise towards his enemy, while Gokin has not yet recovered from the horror he experienced. Makyogan appears in the room holding a dagger and addresses Gochen. With a happy face, he asks if he has any problems. Charon put a sharp knife to Gochang's neck. She threatens Makyogan with the death of his beloved henchman if he attacks. Makyogan stands opposite, assessing the situation. Everything has frozen. Kokan understands that most likely Ha Cheren's source reported that the third son is a complete zero in martial arts. It is clear that she is completely confused because Makyogan just used telekinesis. In her opinion, he could already have reached the peak of his strength and become extremely dangerous. But she doesn't know that Makyogan doesn't care at all about other people's lives. Makyogan begins to walk with a raised dagger towards Cheren. Gochen believes that this is the end of him. He swings and throws the dagger between them. It pierces the floor. Makyogan confidently demands that Kochan be released immediately. Gochan doesn't believe what he hears, that Makyogan would care about anyone's life. He promises to let the killer go if she lets him go. Charon only asks if he is so important to him. Makyogan says that this is just his whim, because he would not want to lose a servant so trivially, and he allows her to leave. Kochan does not believe that Makyogan is really asking for his life. Charon is furious that Mokyogan is asking the leader of the murder clan to release his servant. She asks Mokyogan to kneel down and ask her to let Gochen go. Sighing heavily, Mokyogan prepares to kneel, to the surprise of those around him. Charon herself does not understand why he's doing this for some guard. Almost crouching, Mokyogan snatches a dagger sticking out of the floor. With one quick dash, he closes the distance with the killer. Charon is happy, because she calculated his actions far in advance. However, she is worried that Makyogan is not looking at her, but somewhere to the side. 
She's surrounded by the forces of the bloody Supreme Spirit Cheong Nyon. She feels a hand above her head. Her legs are tied with thick blood. Cheong Nyon attacks and Charon barely manages to jump back, feeling horror. With one wave of his hand, the spirit pushes Go Chang and Charon away from him. Charon still doesn't understand what's going on in the room. She looks around and sees nothing of what she thought she was doing just a minute ago. Cheong Nyon reappears. She is not surprised that her blow was felt because Charon has great strength and training. But while Cheong Nyon was addressing her, Mok Yogan swings a dagger from behind. At the last moment, Charon throws out his knife in order to deflect the flying dagger. Now she is disarmed, so she retreats from Kokan. Mok Yogan congratulates Go Chen on his successful return before quickly removing the needles from his body. Charon is even more confused about Mok Yogan's actions and his real strength. She feels a strong energy behind him, but is not able to fully see. Having assessed the strength of the throw, Charon realizes that Mok Yogan is not yet at the peak of her strength, which means she can win. Charon and Mok Yogan run towards each other, closing the distance for close combat. She takes out the clan's secret weapon, the legendary flying clan needle. Mok Yogan raises his hand with concentrated chi and says that this is a stupid decision. Charon does not agree and throws the needle towards the enemy with all his might. Mok Yogan uses the fusion ritual. He understands that such a needle can kill him instantly. He realizes that he cannot move. His body is covered in snow. The needle is designed in such a way that it cannot be influenced by internal force, which is why it is a deadly weapon against martial artists. The needle is getting closer to Mok Yogan. Charon is already looking forward to victory. Gochan runs in front of Mok Yogan and pushes him aside. Everyone in the room held their breath for what might happen. The needle pierces Koken's body going straight into the chest. He falls, severely wounded by the legendary weapon. Mok Yogan turns around, his gaze full of confusion, and he turns to Gochan. Gohan, who took the blow of the needle and pushed Mok Yongun, fell to the floor, the needle sticking out of his chest. Mok Yongun was furious that Go Chang was hurt, his eyes glowing crimson. Filled with rage, Mok Yongun sent Cheong Yon to deal with the annoying Ha Cherin. Ha Cherin found herself in a hopeless situation and had no choice but to throw paralyzing needles at Mok Yongun. Mok Yongun used the fusion ritual, taking the needles flying at him with his hand to Cherin's surprise. Charon did not have time to notice how Cheong Yon approached her, and the blood began to entangle her like a cobweb. Charon, unable to resist the power of her spirit, only screamed while the bloody hands pulled her closer. Cheong Yon, hovering over Charon, told her that she should have left on good terms when she was given such a chance. Charon asked Cheong Yon what she was while she herself was already transported to the bloody spirit dimension. Mak Yongun appeared in front of her with the words, I told you so, looking at her with a stern gaze. He continued saying that it was stupid, until his hands finally entangled Charon, who was crying in horror. Cheong Yon finished her work and Charon's body fell to the floor like a sack of potatoes. Mok Yong Gun turned around and headed back to Go Chang, who was lying on the floor mortally wounded. Sitting down next to Go Chang, Mok Yong Gun said that he was really sorry that this happened to him, adding that he wanted to work with him more. Mok Yong Gun asked Go Chang why he shielded him from the killer's needle by taking the blow on himself. Go Chang answered him with difficulty that it was his responsibility to protect Mok Yonggun, and besides, he was trying to save him, and therefore Go Chang could not leave him. Go Chang told Mok Yonggun that he was the only one who did not betray him, because everyone else had betrayed him all his life. With his last breath, Ko Chan said that he was the only one who did not abandon him, which is why he is happy, after which he died with a blissful smile on his face. Mok Yonggun was silent and only put his hand on the chest of the guard Go Chang, who had just died. Suddenly, Charon asked Mok Yonggun that Go Chang had died after all, which made Mok Yonggun turn around. Mok Yonggun silently looked at the smiling Chiron, glaring at her, and then said, You have mastered her. Cheong Yon in the body of Charon said that this is true, adding that young bodies are better than all others. Suddenly, on her body, like on everyone else whom Cheong Yon possessed, traces of the disintegration of the vessel appeared. Cheong Yong was furious that even Chiron's body could not support her for a long time. Looking at Gochen's body, Cheong Yong said that she still felt sorry for him because everything should have ended differently. She tells Mok Yong Gun that Go Chang didn't even become a vengeful spirit, believing that this means that he was glad to die for Mok Yong Gun and left without regrets. Cheong Yong's words did not console Mok Yong Gun, and after a short silence, he suddenly started talking about the technique of summoning six spirits. Having begun to collect chi in his hands, Mok Yong Gun also said that vengeful spirits are born due to strong hatred, or in places where the breath of death and regrets are full. Then he added that its core consists of the energy of death, which caused an emotion of bewilderment on Xiong Yon's face. 
Making a seal with his hands, Mok Yong-gun said that he would use the energy of his core to create a vengeful spirit. While Mok Yong-gun was concentrating the energy of death around himself, Chong yeon asked if he was sure that it would work. Changing the seals one after another, Mok Yong-gun began to carry out the ritual of creating a vengeful spirit. Suddenly, light energy began to appear directly from the chest of the dead Kokkan, gathering into a single stream. The energy gathered together, forming a bright blue glowing sphere. A crimson thread immediately reached out to the sphere, connecting the spirit with its new owner. Surprised that Mok Yong-gun succeeded, Chong Yong says that since he used the breath of death, he returned as a familiar spirit. Then he says that despite this, the energy of the spirit is very weak, and if you don't find a vessel for it, it can disappear very quickly. Mok Yong-gun replied to Chong Yong that then he would find the vessel, to which she skeptically asked where he intended to look. Suddenly the expression on her face changed, Raising her hands in front of her chest, she asked if he was joking. Koken's spirit, having separated from his body, seemed to endlessly drown in the void. Kochkan wondered if he had died. Looking at the light from above, he realized that his consciousness was becoming cloudy and that he would no longer get out. Koken thought about how it had turned out, wondering why he had been trying all this time. Having come to terms with his situation, Koken thought that in the end, he did not regret his action. Suddenly, from the depths, fragments of Mok Yong-gun's voice reached Kokan, saying his name. Suddenly, Gochun opened his eyes and saw that Mok Yong-gun was calling him, sitting right in front of him. Gochun immediately began to freak out, asking Mok Yong-gun why he was alive, to which Mok Yong-gun told him to listen to him carefully. He told Kokan that he used the breath of death to keep Kokan in the mortal world, and therefore he became his familiar. He then added that despite this, there was still little energy and his soul could disappear. Kokan interrupted him by asking what all this meant. Mok Yong-gun replied that he had to quickly find a vessel for the soul of Go-chang, who still did not understand what was happening. Silently raising his hand, Go-chang trembled, but Mok Yong-gun replied that there was only one body nearby. Mok Yong-gun said that this is why he transferred Go-chang's soul into the killer's body. After examining his new body, Kokan, being in complete shock, only shouted, What the hell? Go-chang begged Mok Yong-gun to let him out of Chirin's body and return him to his body saying that a woman's body was too much. While straightening the broken door, Mok Yong-gun replied that then Go Chang would disappear, and even if there was another body, the assassin's girl would still have to be killed. Holding his head, Go Kun understood that Mok Yong-gun was right, because if he had killed Charon, he would have had to face the whole clan, realizing that there was no way out. Ko Khan heard a voice behind him saying that he was incredibly lucky, after which he turned around to see where the sound was coming from. Go Chang saw an overly dissatisfied Cheong Yon, who told him that it was difficult for her to even get the vessel. With a pitiful face, Koken thought that he didn't know who was in front of him, but becoming a ghost, he began to feel something new. He felt the difference in status between him and Cheong Yon, enough to see a sea of blood. Go Chen looks at Mok Yong Gun in surprise, thinking about who he is, since there was something like this next to this devil all the time. Cheong Yon asked what happened to Go Chan's face saying that the newcomer should be glad that he got at least some kind of body, to which he replied that he was a man. Chong Yan got angry, saying that he still thinks like a mortal and that he should be happy, because from a second-rate fighter he became a high-class martial artist. Suddenly he heard the phrase, let's check it in practice, which took him by surprise. Mok yung foot immediately quickly approached Go Chung's face, but he managed to dodge the attack. Go Hen didn't have time to ask Mok yung what he was doing before he told him that he had changed a lot. Kokan became inspired, thinking that he had never moved like this and marveling at what the masters were capable of. Cheong Yon asked Go Chung if he was happy now, to which he sheepishly replied that he was still a man. Cheong Yon teased Go Chung by saying that he wanted to enjoy all the delights in secret, to which Go Chung objected. Mok Yong Gun replied that for now, they would leave everything as it is and transfer it as soon as the opportunity arises. Suddenly, a man knocked on the door of the room, introducing himself as Bok Yun from the courtyard. Opening the door, Mok Yung-gun asked him what was the matter. Bok Yun replied that he brought good news. Bok Yun told Mok Yung-gun that the clan head had finally woken up, Taoist Ghost Palace. Master Guo stood on the hill, looking into the distance and holding his in a strange position. Looking through the memories received from New Moon, he recognized the estate where Mok Yung-gun lives, who challenged them, believing that this would be an unusual job. A huge bird-shaped shadow flew towards the Sword Brotherhood castle. Go thought that he was going to explore the territory through the eyes of his familiar, but he came across a barrier called the Territory of the Will of the Spirits. 
He was thinking about what he should do because he would be caught as soon as he touched the barrier, when suddenly Go saw something unusual. He notices a nobleman standing at the gate next to whom are two ladies and a guard. The tipsy nobleman turned out to be none other than the eldest son of Mok Yong Ho. The guard informed him that the rest of the candidates had gathered in honor of the awakening of the head. Guo overheard the conversation, learning that all the candidates were gathering together. He decided that this was his chance, because Mok Yong Gun would have to go to the head. Go planned to deal with Mok Yong Gun one on one, provided that his familiar Gojo could defeat his spirit. Mok Yong Gun was silent for some time, which took the guard aback, after which he replied that he was confused with joy. Mok Yong Gun was mired in his thoughts. The fact that the head woke up is a problem, because he managed to find out that fighting for the place of the head of the clan is annoying and was about to leave since he managed to learn the basics of martial arts. Mok Yun also added that the head asked to gather all his sons. Mok Yong Gun replied that then they should go immediately. On his way out, Mok Yong Gun almost misspoke when addressing Go Chang by name but he corrected himself by telling Charon that the cleaning was hers. Smiling awkwardly standing next to his own corpse, Kok Khan and Charon's body only agreed with his words. Go Chang silently peered out from behind the door, watching as Mok Yong Gun, accompanied by Cheong Yon, went to the meeting of his sons. Kok Khan is surprised that he will have to clean up his own corpse, complaining that his life is now a dark streak. After which, looking at his new body, he blushes thinking about how he ended up in this body. Looking around, Kok Khan, smiling, began to take off his clothes from his body, thinking that he shouldn't walk around in such clothes and that he should wear a security guard's uniform. With an arrogant smile, Cheong Yon suddenly looks into Gochen's room, penetrating through the wall. Cheong Yon only silently exhaled smoke, after which she disappeared behind the wall with a laugh, leaving the embarrassed Gochung alone with himself. Walking towards the head of the clan, Ian suddenly notices someone coming towards him, who also notices Ian. This man turned out to be the youngest son, Mok Yuchon, clearly not happy with having met Mok Yonggun. Cheong Yon sarcastically noted that Mok Yuchon had survived after all, to which Mok Yonggun asked with a laugh whether it was true, after which he said that Mok Yonggun's skin color was not entirely healthy, adding that at least he did not receive a chi deviation due to the technique fabricated by Mok Yonggun. Mok Yonggun told Mok Yuchon that he was glad to see him, saying that three whole days had passed, Mok Yuchon told him to shut up. Mok Yuchin asked Mok Yong Gun if he had tried that secret technique to answer. Cheong Yon amusedly sympathized with Mok Yuchon, and Mok Yong Gun asked if he had any problems. Mok Yong Gun says that he is asking about this seeing his condition, after which he asked if he tried it himself, to which Mok Yong Gun replied that of course he tried. Mok Yuchin grabbed his head and blushed, saying that his knowledge was apparently not enough. Cheong Yon suddenly told Mok Yong Gun that someone was already here, noticing his incredible impudence. She says that someone dared to enter here fearlessly, even after seeing her territory of the will of the spirits. Mok Yong Gun realized that it was someone from the ghostly palace, but Cheong Yon took her leave to solve the problem of the intruder. Heading to the head of the clan, Mok Yong Gun and Mok Yuchon exchange phrases to pass the time. Upon entering the palace, Mok Yong Gun and Mok Yuchon are confronted by Mok Yipion and his mother, surrounded by guards. Mok Yipion was thinking about why Mok Yong Gun and Mok Yuchon came together while Mrs. Seok was wiping Mok Yong Ho's face with a handkerchief. She told her son not to say a word because he reeked of alcohol, saying that his mother would do everything for him. Looking back at Mok Yong Hoon, Mok Gun Pyong thought about how pitiful the firstborn of the family is. He wondered if their father had called them for the one. Mrs. Sok nervously thought that there was only one reason to call all the sons immediately after waking up, and it had to be it. Mok Yuchian only thought that he didn't care whether there was truth in the scriptures, because if he became the heir, it would solve all his problems. Mok Yonggun thought that the head of the clan was one of the ten strongest masters in the central province. He was only able to sense the powerful man's energy when the head woke up. The head of the clan allowed his sons to enter, after which the doors to his chambers swung open. The sons of the clan immediately greeted the head, congratulating him on his recovery. The head of the Mokindan clan sat in front of his sons, surprised that they all came. Mok Yong Ho and Mok Kun Pyong just stood silently in front of the head, noticeably nervous. Mok Yong Gun looked at his son, silently running his gaze over each of them. He suddenly understood the reason why everyone was so attentive to the state of the head, thinking that it was not a matter of position. Mok Yong Gun realized that the reason was that all his sons understood his authority. Mok Yong Gun thought about how surprised he was that despite the fact that the head was practically dying, he did not show a drop of courage, as if nothing had happened to him. Looking at the Hallmaster Mokindan with all his power, Mok Yong Gun thought about what kind of creature could bring him half to death, 
Meanwhile, events moved to another place in the castle, to the usual sword hall. In the annex of ordinary warriors, certain two people killed all the guards, discussing that Mokendon had been saved from death. The man with the straw hat on his head answered the second one with the huge sword that he heard the screams of Gu Dao, the Dokebi of Mount Luwu. The big man laughed, saying that the Taoist master intervened and saved his life. His colleague asked what their plan was now. Passing by the surviving guard, the big man replied that there was only one plan now, to personally kill Mokendan. Suddenly, the big man stopped, asking the guard if he had slept well. After which, with a swing of his huge sword, he didn't leave a wet spot on the poor fellow. The big guy broke down the door to the dojo by kicking the head of one of the now deceased guards. Then he raised his sword, indicating to the many fighters hiding on the roof to move forward. The sons of the clan lined up in front of the clan head, holding their hands behind their backs. The head of the Mokendan clan turned to his sons, asking them if they understood why they had been called. None of the sons could say a word, closing their eyes or looking away. Suddenly, Mokyongan casually asked the head of the clan whether the head's decision to name the heir was the reason for the meeting. Looking at Mokyongun, Mokindan thought that his son had changed noticeably, wondering if the chief servant's words could be true. Only after waking up, Mokindan spoke with the main servant, who told him that it was none other than his third son who saved him. The servant replied that it was so, saying that they say that he single-handedly stopped the maddened master of Taoism, who was possessed by an evil spirit. Mokindan at first thought that this was a coincidence, or that Mokyongun simply wanted to get the head position. Looking at Mokyongun, he thought that the child who could not raise his head in his presence now did not show a single drop of excitement, wondering what changes had occurred while he was not paying attention to him. Mokendan decides to test Mokyongun, answering that he will conduct a test to choose a successor. Mokendan said that he would carefully check them to see if they had enough qualifications to become the head, when suddenly Mokyongun raised his hand. He apologized to the head, saying that he would not take this test. Everyone in the room looked at him in surprise. Mokindan asked if he really would not take the test. Mok Yong-gun replied that it was so. Mok yong Pion at that moment thought that it was even better, because if he immediately gave up, then there would be no problems from him. Mokindan, stroking his beard, asked him the reasons for his refusal to participate in the test. Mok yong -gun replied that the reason was that he was not good enough to be the head. Mokindan asked why Mok yong -gun thought so, to which he replied that he lacked qualifications. Mok yong -un continued by saying that he has a lot of disadvantages when compared to his older brothers or even his younger brothers. He said that the head must have valor or he must reach the top, after which he says that he does not fall into this category, saying that he refuses the position of head of the clan. Such an answer only caused Mokindan to burst into laughter, unexpected for everyone present. Having calmed his laughter, Mokindan replied that he understood Mok yong -un's arguments. Mokindan realized that Mok yong -gun had truly changed, that he was not deceiving him to get the position, and that he had saved him of his own free will. He sees that the child who was previously noisy is now reflecting on himself and is even ready to give up his place as head for the sake of the prosperity of the clan. Smiling, Mokindan thinks that it is nice to see how your child grows, coming to the conclusion that he is more than worthy. Taking off his robe, Mokindan again asked Mok yong -gun why he considered himself unworthy. Everyone present immediately froze in shock when they saw what the clan head's robe hid behind. Mokindan told his sons that they must have been aware that he was being attacked and that in a rage the attacker cut off his hand. Mokindan said that the one who saved his life was his third son, which makes Mok Gopyong angry. Mokindan said that Mokyongun himself said that the head must reach the top, saying that this is quite enough to achieve. Mokyongpyong, filled with anger and envy, thought about what he had heard about some incident but did not think that Mok yong gun could do something like that. However, continuing to look at Mok yong gun Mok Yipyong wondered why he was silent. The picture of his past that had returned to him froze before Mok yong guns eyes. He again stood at the burnt house next to the corpse of his grandfather, unable to change anything. Looking at the body of the head of the Mokindan clan, he saw a hieroglyph that was painfully familiar to him. The same hieroglyph that he instructed to convey to Kokon, depicted on a small sheet of paper. The same hieroglyph that was on the body of his dead grandfather when he found it. It's a mark just like the one left on his chest and stomach. And this mark, this burning wound, was inflicted by none other than the killer of his grandfather. Mok Yong-gun's face suddenly broke into a crazy smile with the realization that he was finally on his trail.